We welcome you to the fourth workshop of the activities on communities, climate change, and health equity workshop series. I'd like to read the land acknowledgement. While we are gathered today, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nuchuk Tank and Puskatoway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and her stewards whose relationship spans generations. We recognize that indigenous nations have distinct knowledge systems and ways of knowing and hold wisdom for how to live with the land. Respecting this knowledge as we gather to discuss living in extreme heat, it is our duty to listen, work with those who see with two eyes to create better, safer communities for all in the future. I want to thank the planning committee, the National Academy staff, and today's moderators and participants, all of whom have worked very hard to bring together these exciting events. Before we dive into today's goals and objectives, Audrey Thevinon from the National Academies will provide some context for this workshop. Audrey, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Venkat. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Thank you. So first, here. First, I would like to acknowledge the excellent staff that has been working very hard with the committee to prepare for today's yeah. events. Um, you will all see those individuals that work on the on the behind the scenes today and making hopefully your experience, um, uh, participatory experience um, for all today enjoyable. Um, some logistics here. Um, we are in a Zoom meeting. This is not a webinar, so you will be muted and camera off and entrance, uh, as you can see here on the screen. Please, um, for the fact that, you know, we have that Zoom and you can communicate with each other through the chat, we would like you to put your first name and your last name into your name. So rename yourself and you can see here how you can do this. Will you use the Slido platform, which is an outside platform to field questions? At any given time, please enter questions um, into this, uh, this experience. And in the chat will be uh, put the Slido information in order to access this. Do not use the chat to ask questions. We will not um, look at those questions. We will only look at the Slido platform. We will use the chat, however, so uh, to, to put comments, you can put comments there. You can also communicate with each other. You can send uh, direct messages to each other. We really want it to be an experience that you can share with each other. If you need assistance, please find on the uh, participant list, uh, Leila Garrick, uh, our colleagues here, or any of the staff member. You will see that we have our names followed by Nassim. This is the staff uh, today. The workshop um, agenda, the spe speaker biographies, everything else, uh, you can find that on our website. We will also put the, the Zoom, the link in the, in the chat. Uh, you can also use the an, uh, automated closed captioning as, as shown here where you can find it if you would like to, uh, for accessibility, if you would like to, to follow the captions. Finally, this meeting is recorded. All the recording in addition to all the material, including the biographies and the agenda today and the presentations of our, our excellent speakers will be on our website. So a little bit of an overview of what the HMI, the Environmental Health Matters Initiative, initiative is. It is a cross-academy initiative. So here you can see HMI all the way on top that cut across our three academies, engineering, science, and medicine. But if you go on the bottom of this um, organogram, you can see also the seven divisions at the academies that we cover. We have the opportunity to really tap into the excellent work of all those divisions everywhere from behavioral science, all the way to transportation, a policy, engineering, so on and so forth. The um, HMI mission is uh, to aims to improve the health of all people equitably. We use a system thinking, but also you know provide evidence based approaches 
uh, to advance accessible, lasting solutions. We have three main objectives, establish enduring partnerships, propose actionable solutions, and all of these um, by implementing a comprehensive systems approach for environmental health solutions. This workshop is part of a series, and um, we have um, the chance to have three sponsors uh, for this workshop, um, the Center for Disease uh, control and Prevention, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and the Environmental Protection Agency. In addition to their continuing interest in tackling the most pressing issues in environmental health, they recognize the National Academy's uh, core values of operating independently of any, um, from any sponsorship. This, uh, this series um, recognize that communities uh, that are the least able to respond often bear the largest health burden. And this series is aimed to explore the current state of knowledge about climate-related health disparities and the specific action co-produced with change makers and leaders at all levels of decision to improve climate-related health outcomes for all. We have done three workshops. Today is the fourth one. The first one discusses the disproportionate impact of climate change with a, a range of different um, interest groups from health experts, resident practitioners, climate scientists, and other people with lived experience. The second workshop was uh, focused on state level imp implementations. And we looked at identifying actions that could help improve climate related health outcomes. The third workshop took a thematic uh, focus and we looked at extreme heat and we explored the real world challenges related to extreme heat along with actions being pursued to prevent, adapt to, or mitigate the health consequences of these extreme events. And today's uh, the topic is um, looking at flawed adaptation strategy to support health equity. And for this, I will ask our co-chairs, Van Kat, to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. First, I'd like to acknowledge the work of our outstanding diverse committee of experts in preparing the workshop today. Uh, today, day one of the workshop, the session will be focused on health risks and inequalities stemming from storm, water, runoff, induced flooding events, and barriers for implementations for solutions to all, as we have four sessions, Monday, March 18th, day two of the workshop will be centered on adaptation strategies to improve community resilience and reduce health inequities, for which we will have four more sessions. So the two days build on each other. So please come and join us back on Monday. At the end of the workshop series, we'll produce a report in the format of a Proceedings in Brief, or PIP. The link to the last PIB on extreme heat was posted in the chat earlier. These workshops are designed to be highly interactive and including stories reflecting people's lived experiences. So we expect these uh, workshops will help the way, uh, pave the way for the future uh, for understanding the interaction between science and society. So most of the times we in academia focus so much on the science, we forget that the real benefits of that translate to society. So I cannot think of a more interesting series of workshops than these organized by EHMI. So I know we are a few minutes earlier, nothing wrong because we can have more time for questions and answers. So let's get started with session one. Uh, the session one, is the state of the knowledge, and we have a few keynote speakers. The goals of this first session are to set the stage broadly for the current state of knowledge regarding flooding, health, communities, and policies, focusing on ex existing barriers that we need to do now to promote and implement flood adaptation strategy that would support health equity. We have a fantastic lineup for this session with two speakers. In the interest of time, all biographies can be found on our website. Each speaker will have about 15 minutes or so to provide their thoughts, and then we'll open the floor for questions and answers. Audience members, 
you are welcome to submit questions anytime using the Slido platform, where everyone can upload the questions they want to hear answered. We'll address as many of these as possible during our panel discussion after the two talks. Audience can use chat for comments, and we, use, we request you to use the chat function wisely. So now moving on to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Maureen Lichmond, who is the Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. Today, Maureen will provide an overview of environmental health threats of flooding. Maureen, please take it away. Thank you very much. And I'm so pleased um, to join um, this workshop. Um, the evidence that we're going to present um, are so clear. And the focus that you just set up so nicely is that it's on people. It's about real people. And so um, if I can have my first slide, please. We could go all the way to the beginning, thank you. Um, thank you. So when we talk about flooding and we connect that with environmental health threats, it's really important to think about the so what question. The so what from a perspective of who suffers? Who do we need to, for whom do we need to focus our um, efforts on? Who are most vulnerable? and where do we lack the most resilience? So that's where the focus is for uh, my keynote today to set the stage actually not only for today, but also for next week's um, when we talk about more granular issues. Next, please. And so my presentation objectives um, are to discuss flooding as an environmental phenomenon, um, as a phenomenon of disaster, and as a climate driver. Second, to assess the compounded impact of flooding, not only on physical health, but also on psychosocial well being. And then, thirdly, to examine what do we do next uh, to address flooding from a public health perspective. Next slide, please. Many of you are familiar with um, this um, figure that really looks at climate drivers, um, the changes from an environmental perspective, and then ultimately the impact on human health. When I teach, I actually call this the wheel of death um, with my students. But clearly, clearly what we're seeing is that whether you look at more extreme weather or rising temperatures or increased levels of CO2, or rising sea levels, the array, the, the, the slice of the pie, so to speak, goes directly from a, an environmental phenomenon to a health outcome. You know, when I was asked to, um, to add, when, when um, the world population became 8 billion strong, and I was asked, well, what keeps you up at night? as an environmental health scientist and a climate and health researcher, what keeps me up at night are four drivers. Heat, extreme heat, infectious disease, air and water pollution, and food insecurity, both food safety and food insecurity. So if we take those four, next slide please, and look what's happening on the ground. No one is safe anymore from flooding and no place is safe anymore from flooding. So if we look at Mississippi um, versus um, Planada in California or the rains, heavy rains that happened and flooding that happened in Texas and Louisiana, there is no place, in fact, no place in the world that is safe. Next, please. Including in the state that I currently live now in Pennsylvania. Here you see a statewide heavy precipitation and the inland flooding consequences. And I'd like you to look at particularly the consequence rating and the impact on human health. And so whether you look at human health narrowly from a physical perspective, 
Environmental justice is right there. Agriculture, as, you, as remember I mentioned, food security is also a critical of critical conference uh, consequence rating. Um, recreation, tourism, but I want you to particularly look at the built environment and the infrastructure that is so fragile in all of in all states in the United States, but all over the world. So if you combine human health, the narrow human health, environmental justice and equity, agriculture and the built infrastructure, you see the cumulative impact of the consequence of flooding on public health. Next, please. So I'll take you to all the places that I've lived in the US. Um, when in 2005, I moved August 1, 2005 to join um, my academic institution then, um, I too, after three weeks, lost everything. I too, after three weeks, had to send my kids away to another state to go to school. And I too was dedicated to um, protect the health of children with a number of us, particularly children with moderate to severe asthma. And so we have all seen the pictures of disparities. We've all seen the pictures of um, the flooding of the city of New Orleans. Uh, what we've worked together is with communities and asked communities to be engaged in what we should focus on. And so while we design a multi-year um, environmental epidemiological study, the message that I bring here that the environmental phenomenon had both physical and psychosocial impacts. When we evaluated what the main causes were of asthma exacerbations in children five to nine year old. Um, yes, there were 79 uh, types of mold spores. And yes, mold in the homes was the major cause. But the number two reason, statistically significant, the number two reason why kids had asthma exacerbation after um, Hurricane Katrina were losing a pet and changing schools more than twice in one year. And so the integration and the cumulative impact of physical effects and psychosocial effects impact disproportionately people who are disparate, um, disproportionately people who have suffered from environmental justice and environmental inequities. And so when you look at that total picture, um, it is an even worse um, impact that flooding can have on us in public health, on population health in general, and on people who are most vulnerable specifically. Next, please. And so if we look at flooding from an as an environmental health phenomenon, to the right, you see a picture of a home, a home um, fully molded. Um, and in fact, this was a home that was used by many musicians in training. Um, you know, jazz is a big deal in New Orleans um, uh, currently and definitely in 2005. So loss of homes, forced migration. We don't often talk about forced migration as an impact of flooding. Chemical exposures, I mentioned that, and food insecurity. If you can't go to the grocery store to get um, milk and bread and all you um, and all you need, uh, then we're getting into a situation of food, food insecurity. I mentioned specifically the psychosocial impacts, stress and anxiety. In fact, to this day, and 20, uh, 2005 is uh, almost 20 years ago, my youngest one still comes home um, when a hurricane happens to be safe in another state. Um, and so that angst, uh, that trauma stays with children, particularly a very, very long time. And so what we have seen are both risks to, from a chemical stressors perspective and a non-chemical stressors perspective. I talked with you a little bit about the study and um, I'll spend some more time talking about the United Homa Nation as a specific vulnerable population and the work, the phenomenal work that they're doing there um, supported by the Gulf Research Program. Um, and then um, underground storage tanks who started to leak because of flooding and they were uh, 
no longer underground, they were above ground. And so you see that cumulative impact impacting first the environment and then people. Next, please. The United Homa Nation, I had the privilege to work with for over a decade. Um, and it is a tribe that not a lot of people know about. It's a tribe of about 19,000 members, um, but it's a tribe that stays together, that is spread over many states, that stays together um, because of the social networks and the sense of place. But it's that very sense of place um, that has impacted repeatedly by flooding. So much so that you see the picture and the building, this was about um, at the height of the, uh, of the pandemic around um, 2021, that very building that finally became their new home after multiple flooding situations was flooded again. And so the last time I visited, part of that building was being reconstructed. And so how do you keep, and I'll come back to that resilience piece, how do you keep going? How do you keep going, particularly um, when flooding and rising sea level sticks over the very land that you live on? How do you keep going when your culture is being impacted because of forced migration? It is all about um, not looking at flooding as a, it's now here and it's gone. It is about flooding as a pervasive um, insult on people's lives. Next, please. And so we can look at um, the impact of um, flooding um, and other extreme weather events from an individual perspective. We've talked about all that makes an individual, um, all that comprises individual risk from a personal attribute, but to also to chemical stressors and how community links to those stressors, whether they get, the, a community is supportive or whether a community is fragile. Um, the link between individuals and the environment, I always say the health of the environment is inextricably linked to that of people. And so if the environment is sick, people will be sick. And so that, that link is critically important when we look at what's the impact over the lifespan, not the impact of a single offense. And so the bottom line here is when we look at individual outcomes in the context of the exposome um, from a public health perspective, it is inextricably linked to what's happening at the population level and at the community level. Next, please. And so how do we do this? We do this through precision public health. So just like precision medicine, where we can fingerprint the genetic makeup of an individual, we're fingerprinting the makeup of a community. And we'll, I'll explain what that fingerprinting is about so that we can tailor interventions specifically to not only the assets, but the gaps of what's happening in a community. So it is the juxtapositioning of precision medicine and precision public health that will sustainably address issues like flooding. Next, please. And so when we look at the cumulative impact of environmental phenomena on communities, we cannot escape the very historic burden that disparities and inequities bring. On top of that are the environmental health threats as we know them, air pollution, soil pollution, water pollution. On top of that are particularly in the Gulf South, um, but all over our country and often all over the world, as I started my presentation, the flooding, the disasters, the hurricanes that are exacerbated by climate change climate change itself, itself. and in, um, in other um, settings, you could even think about what's ultimately happening to the, the planet. So how do we then unravel community vulnerability and in the context, not only of public health research, but also public health practice? Next, please. And so what does flood has to do that with, with, how do we look at floods in that context? 
And so let's unravel um, the community resilience component. How do we, particularly in the inter-disaster period, so when things are quiet, how do we invest in the six areas that make up a community? How do we invest in the natural environment? How do we invest in infrastructure? Remember, I, I talked about the building infrastructure, the built environment and the built infrastructure. How do we make sure a community is financially stable and that we value and support both the human side, but the cultural side, as we mentioned with the United Toma Nation and other, other, other cultures? How do we make sure there is strong social cohesion and how do we make sure that the political system provides a governance that is supportive for sustaining healthy communities? And so the National Academies of Sciences has spent, and I was honored to be part of this process, a, a special report on this. And I uh, really encourage you to look at that report more deeply. Next, please. But what's missing? When we look at how to undergird community resilience, key is, and this is another um, study that, um, that the National Academy of Science Engineering Medicine has done, the key is to build the pillars, support the pillars of this broken bridge, this bridge that is very fragile, this bridge that requires us to do things differently, whether we do it from um, population-based research or just simply um, more interventions, how do we transition? How do we invest in making sure we can do precision public health? And particularly in this context, precision environmental public health. We can't do it if we have disparate databases. We can't do it if, the, if transportation data is um, disconnected from morbidity and mortality data if um, access to food, the locations of grocery stores is miles away from where communities live. So the integration of disparate databases is critical for us to make tailored decisions to increase community resilience. Similarly, um, how do we assure that the fragile infrastructure, whether it's physical infrastructure or health infrastructure and access to care? How do we make sure that infrastructure can withstand uh, yet another flood? How do we make sure there is sustainable funding and funding doesn't only come, this is one of my pet peeves, funding doesn't only come um, after the disaster happened, but it's available in a sustainable way. How do we build that workforce that will do the work? So what's the human capital? And ultimately, as I mentioned before, how do we assure sustained and um, protective governance? Next, please. So what's the bottom line? How do we move forward? We target individual and community vulnerability. So put the resources where they needed the most in the most effective of times. Focus on both the physical and psychosocial well-being at the ind individual level. At the community level, employ precision public health strategies to strengthen um, that social capital, the six domains that I talked about. Um, invest in strengthening the pillars, as I mentioned, particularly during the inter-disaster period, and ultimately require, not as an afterthought, but to require community-engaged scholarship to bolster resilience. So let me stop there and I look forward to questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you so very much for that very insightful talk. Now moving on to our next speaker. Our next speaker, for this session is Margaret A. Walls from Resources for the Future. Today, Dr. Walls will be speaking about flood policy in the United States. Margaret, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. So give me a second here.
Can y'all see that? Let me put it on full screen mode. Okay, maybe if somebody can say yes, you're seeing it because yes, I can't we see, can it. see it. Okay, awesome, perfect. Okay, so thanks very much. What I'm going to talk about today, so I am um, at Resources for the Future. We're a nonprofit, non-advocacy research organization. And I um, direct our program on climate risk and resilience. I'm an economist. I do a lot of work on policy. I do not do a lot of work on health. So what I'm going to talk about today is really give you the lay of the land on how we address flooding in the United States. And we do a lot of different things. So I'm going to touch on each of them and open to questions to get in deeper if we need to. As way of background, this is um, some information on the number and costs of flooding since 1980, annual numbers through 2021. And this is you know, data you may have seen before. It's the NOAA Billion Dollar Disasters um, website where they pull these numbers together. So this is any dis uh, official disaster that occurs in the United States that causes over a billion dollars in, in costs or damages. And this just shows you, if you can see from the bars, that the number of events is going up. We're having more and more disasters, but also the costs of those events vary a lot. That's the red line. And, you know, we have really big hits in certain years. So 2005, we had Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita. 2017, we had Harvey and Irma and Maria. 2012 was Hurricane Sandy. So, you know, they're very spiky. We have some really disastrous events that occur sometimes that cause hundreds of billions of dollars in damages. But on the whole, things are going up. And I'll, I will point out that this is not only floods, but also hurricanes shown here. And they account for, in the two of them together, three quarters of all disaster costs in the U.S. come from those types of events. So what do we do about this problem? We do a number of things, and I'm going to talk about each of these. We invest in a lot of stuff, large scale infrastructure. We also try to get people to do things on their individual properties and in local communities to mitigate hazards. We try to do, to some extent, to just reduce exposure to risk. So we can mitigate on the one hand, like try to make our homes safer and so forth, or we can just get out of the way. And that's what reducing exposure is. Obviously, we have a federally run flood insurance program that you all probably know about. So I'll talk about that and, and the implications of it. As part of that program, we do lots of mapping and communication about flood risks. And then of course, we deal with recovery after disasters occur. So let's talk about each of these. Flood control infrastructure. In the United States, we have spent billions of dollars on hard infrastructure across the country um, to try to protect ourselves. So most of this has been through federal dollars. Um, in the mid 20th century, the US Army Corps of Engineers, believe it or not, accounted for a lot of the federal spending that we were spending on everything. And we built miles and miles of levees and flood walls. We now have 23,000 miles of levees in the US. Also, in your local communities, you're spending on stormwater infrastructure, there's dams and reservoirs, tide gates, lots of different things. Um, in each, on each of these slides, I just want to have a little bit of a takeaway about this, the point here. And one thing I'll say about infrastructure is that um, the average, just talking about levees for a minute, the average age of levees in the United States is 60 years old. They're getting old. A lot of our infrastructure, you probably know this, is it old and in need of repair. It's also not built for a changing climate. So we have a lot of stuff that isn't ready for uh, the extreme events we have now, the rising sea levels, and so forth. So all of this costs a lot of money. It costs money to build. It costs money to maintain. And we're probably um, not doing enough. We also do things, you know, at the individual property level, or we try to get people to do it and in communities. So in FEMA designated floodplains, which we're going to talk about in a moment with respect to flood insurance, FEMA requires um, some things. They require local communities to have a floodplain ordinance, and that ordinance has to do something with building codes. Um, and those building codes generally, they're fairly minimal really, but they require first floor elevation in the floodplain. 
Um, they also have a few other things um, in them. But to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, you have to have these things. Beyond that, there's some things that other things that get done. There's little bits of financial incentives here and there, lots of communication, outreach, education to try to get people to do the very few number of things that can be done to reduce your risk on your individual property. You can elevate your heating and air conditioning equipment. There's a photo of that there. You can elevate your home. That's quite expensive. Uh, you also can do small things like in install flood vents. One takeaway here is, first of all, there isn't a lot, um, and it's hard to get people to do this stuff. Um, I also do work on wildfires, and there's a lot of stuff we can do in the wildfire space. It's still very hard to get people to do things, either for financial reasons, for people not paying attention, for having other stuff that's more important for them to deal with. So as I said um, above, another thing we can do is just get out of the way. So this is called reducing exposure to risk. Um, so there's the risk that an event occurs, but there's also the costs that happen when an event occurs. And that has to do with how many people and how, many, how much property, the value of that property that's sitting there getting flooded. So how do we deal with that problem? We can deal with it through a variety of, of things. A lot of them are left to local governments. So local governments do most of our land use planning and zoning in the United States. They are not, they're in charge of it, not the federal government, in general, not even the state governments. It really falls to your local communities. And what those local communities can do is a number of things if they want to. They can rearrange their zoning to try to in, encourage less development in risky areas. They can try to protect those areas by turning them into parks, greenways, various kinds of buffers. Um, they can, increasingly, there's a few cities that are doing what are called resilience overlay zones, where you, again, that's a way of working in your zoning code to try to just redirect development. So those are all things you do ahead of time. What if you already have a bunch of properties in the way? Then we have property buyouts. And I'm sure you all know about these. This is where an already developed property, often that's been in hurt in a storm, has been damaged, will end up being, will pay to buy that property out. So, um, and the map on the right is a picture, just an example of that. This is the Hurricane Sandy buyout program after in New York. And the red area shows what areas were inundated and those blue and yellow dots are where people actually sold their homes and were bought out. And a lot of cases, those properties are bought out and destroyed and the land is turned into open space. In some cases, they're bought out and the properties are um, elevated and made more flood resilient. This kind of approach is very effective at reducing disaster costs, but we don't do very much of it and it's very challenging. It's challenging to make buyouts work because as you can imagine, it's difficult to get people to move. There are a whole host of issues with it. It's also difficult to get at this ahead of time with planning and zoning because communities rely on property tax revenues to pay for local services. There's a lot of resistance in communities, um, but this is an effective approach if we can figure out how to do it. So let's talk for a minute about the very important National Flood Insurance Program and risk mapping. So insurance is critical. We all have homeowners insurance if we own a home. Um, insurance protects us when we have a big loss. And it's critical in the flood space. It really serves sort of two purposes, flood insurance. First of all, it provides a signal of the risk and the prices that you pay should provide a signal. So it should increase incentivize you to kind of do the right thing, live in the right places, pay for mitigation and so forth. But of course, also it's a very big um, aid in recovery after a flood. If you have a national flood insurance policy, you get up to $250,000 for damage to your property after an event and up to 100,000 for building contents. That money comes in pretty quickly compared to other things. And if you don't have a flood insurance policy, what are you going to do? You have to rely on your savings, some sort of loan if you can get it, charity, and federal assistance. Um, so insurance is critical. 
and floods are not covered in a standard homeowner's policy, you must have a separate flood only policy. And most of those come from the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, a key part of the flood insurance world is these maps that FEMA generates. So these are called flood insurance rate maps or firms. And that's the FEMA designated 100 year floodplain, which I'm sure you've all heard about. I put an example here. This is Washington, D.C. Since we're, I'm in Washington, D.C., the National Academy is in Washington, D.C., I thought I would look up the flood map for Washington, D.C. and put it here. And it just illustrates the pinkish areas are the 100-year floodplain, and those bright red is the 500-year, so still at risk, but less risk. Within the floodplain, if you have a federally backed mortgage, you are required to have a flood insurance policy. Outside of the mapped floodplain, you are not required to have a flood insurance policy. This has created some problems. We have a very large, what's called a flood insurance gap in the US. Not a lot of people buy flood insurance. In low income communities, that gap is bigger. And part of the challenge is that the flood maps have been somewhat misinterpreted. They've been misinterpreted that if you are outside the line, you are not at risk. And in fact, that is not the case. After many floods, people are are find their homes inundated, and we hear these stories all the time, even though they are outside the floodplain. So we have a challenge in communicating risks to people. The flood maps were not actually intended to do that, but they are the main thing people look at to know if they're at risk. So this is an issue. And uh, the lastly, let's talk about disaster aid. So when we have, a dis this is another part of our federal policy toward flooding. Um, after disaster strike, we step in and provide assistance. Um, there are two types of assistance from FEMA, individual assistance, which goes to homeowners and renters, and public assistance, which goes to state and local governments, mainly local governments. HUD also provides money and through its community development block grant, program, and that has grown in recent years, actually. So we think of FEMA only, but actually housing and urban development also provides funding, and USDA to a certain extent. So the graph on this slide just shows you the size of the of this, um, and I just pulled this out of a Congressional Budget Office um, report, and it shows you disaster aid that comes through regular annual appropriations from Congress and then these supplemental appropriations, which the point of this report was just to show you how big the supplemental is in times where we have really big disasters like 2005, again in 2017, and even the, the COVID-19 was, was considered a disaster and we have supplemental appropriations for that. And, um, this is, you know, we spend a lot of money on recovering after storms hit. So that's the point of this figure. And I think um, a kind of a takeaway that I would like to, to give you is that while things are somewhat changing, our policies in the U.S. have mostly been post-disaster focused at the expense of pre-disaster. So I mentioned things like, you know, mitigation in communities, um, you know, how we try to get homeowners to elevate their homes and we do all those kinds of things. Those are peanuts compared to the amount of money we spend after a disaster strikes in just recovering from that disaster. Um, and I think it's fairly well known that FEMA has been a post-disaster oriented agency. And I do think that's changing. And in order to really build resilience pre-disaster, we need to have our policies more focused on pre-disaster. Um, so this is a whole other conversation we can have and maybe we can talk about it afterwards, um, but this is just sort of the lay of the land on how our policy currently works. And I, I wanna have one last slide that talks about some justice and equity challenges in the flood policy space. Uh, there's several findings in the literature, certain things that we know. First of all, we know that low-income populations and people of color are disproportionately exposed to flood risks. There's several studies I can point you to that have shown that for a variety of reasons. We just find that maybe because property values are lower or a number of things, um, we find more socially vulnerable people living in those high-risk areas. 
But even beyond that, and, you know, our first talk yelled at this a little bit, even beyond that exposure question, when a flood hits, many populations are more vulnerable. And we're more vulnerable because of underlying health risks, English language challenges, lower incomes make it just harder to recover. Um, we heard about Maureen after Hurricane Katrina sending kids somewhere else to go to school. Well, obviously not every family can do that. So you, your ability to recover after a flood is much more difficult for certain populations. And then lastly, we have justice and equity challenges bound up in the way a lot of our policies and institutions work. And the one thing, a few things I will point to, the first one being in FEMA, benefit cost analyses loom large. So if you are applying for some grant programs that FEMA runs, you have to do a benefit cost analysis as a requirement of your grant application. And you have to show that the benefits of what you're gonna spend that money on outweigh the costs. If you are getting um, disaster aid from FEMA, that is partly based on your property values. There are a lot of things that in the way we spend money are based on avoided flood damages or property value losses, things that are gonna be more money to higher property value households. And we are trying to work, FEMA has made a number of changes to some grant programs, trying to get around this problem. It's an increasingly recognized problem, but it is a problem. Beyond that, there are a lot of issues in grants with local cost share requirements. So uh, low income communities, again, FEMA is addressing some of this, but there are cost share requirements. It's not just federal money. You've got, you've got to pony up and put some skin in the game. And that can be very difficult for under-resourced communities. And then lastly, and this is another thing that's getting well recognized, is that it is daunting to try to apply for money and get that money and get that help. It's daunting for individuals to apply for individual assistance for FEMA. It's daunting for communities to apply for grants because of the paperwork requirements, the technical requirements, and all of those things. And again, agencies are working on this with a lot of develop, uh, technical assistance, but it's we have a long way to go. Um, and that's in my box here. Problems are recognized. Changes are being made. You all are probably familiar with the Justice 40 initiative, which um, says that 40% of the benefits of certain federal investments have to go to disadvantaged communities. And that's that's been a help, but these are challenging problems and will not be solved overnight. So that's it, thank you very much. I'll just point you to uh, some of the things I talked about are in some reports on our website and um, I would direct you to those. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen and Margaret. So very inspiring and so very complete and thoughtful. So now I want to invite questions from the audience and please type them in Slido as uh, instructed to you before. Uh, you know, before we start off, I, I, I'll take the chair's prerogative uh, and I'm gonna ask the first question. And the first question, is uh, what kind of, stra and this is for both of you, you know, what kind of strategies have researchers used to incorporate community engaged scholarship without further marginalizing the perspectives and needs of communities, hopefully prior than post disasters? Prevention is better than cure. Please. Uh, uh, let me start, and then, uh, and then Margaret probably will add. Um, you cannot, thank you so much for asking that, that very pointed question. You cannot, uh, as we say in disaster management, uh, particularly in disaster preparedness, you can exchange, you know, the old fashioned business cards in the middle of a disaster, which means that you have to be infested for decades in your community. You have to be with, you have to be from that community, you know, be in that community. Um, to be able to then partner and engage. And that doesn't mean um, that absolutely is not 
asking for that support letter at the 11th hour before you submit your grant. It means that um, when nothing is happening, when you invest in the community, when you're part of the celebrations, when you're part of addressing the concerns, I could tell you that after, for example, particularly after the oil spill, we did three things. One, we went to the community and said, what's, what's, what's worrying you? And their worries were threefold. Was the safe seafood, was the fish safe to eat, given what would happen? What will happen to the babies? And the babies and moms of the babies were, babies of the moms were pregnant. And is the air safe to breathe? We took those to create an entire consortium driven by community. So it's that community engaged scholarship. The other thing we did, and I'm very proud of that, is that we integrated high school students within the School of Public Health to learn about environmental issues, to learn about floods, to learn about air pollution, and embedded them and connected them with a faculty member. And that door opened not only opportunities for college, but there are now physicians and engineers um, walking around because of those two months with us. Um, and I'm doing the same program here in Pittsburgh and it's no different. And so engaging early, engaging sustainably, um, even without funding, and that's the key, that's the key challenge, right? But that's the test. Uh, and investing in the community on the front line, making sure that, for example, the Bachelors of Science and Public Health students are required to do 120 hours of surface learning in frontline communities. There where I was then in the Gulf and here where I am now in Pittsburgh. That's the difference you make in a sustainable way. Yeah, Margaret, I agree please. with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with what Maureen said. I will say there are really challenge, big challenges. So I just want to, um, you know, and I'm not the best person, probably. Nobody wants really the economists coming in and talking to them. But um, I think there are challenges in sort of meeting and communicating around the difficult issues. Um, so some of those that I mentioned um, are things like, you know, possible relocation. Everybody hates that term, but, you know, thinking about where you're going to live, what a thriving community looks like. And I think it's really important to kind of have those discussions up front at the beginning of projects. I have a project right now where we're trying to do that and not about relocation, but I mean, just about what you want your community to look like. Where are the problems in the community? What are the potential solutions? And talk through the solutions from the technical side where you might have the flood modeler, you might have the people who can kind of tell you, you know, the people that know about climate forecasts and kind of can convey that, but also get the on the ground knowledge because people know a lot about their communities. They know where places flood. You know, there there's information to be gathered. And then in talking through solutions, just to try to get that early on in the, pro in the, in the process, as Maureen mentioned, to sort of get everybody working towards a goal that you can kind of bring both the technical, you know, and data and all those things that you can bring as researchers to the table in conjunction with the community. So I, I, I just don't, I want to just say it's challenging early on is important and figuring out what you're both, what, what, what is the objective? Is but we, we've, we've advanced. So progress has been made since Katrina. That's my kind of my mark there. Um, we are now um, investing in part of preparedness. We are now recognizing that recovery doesn't take a year. It could take 10 years. It could take 20 years. And so investment in that phase is really critical. Um, but communication is so key. And I'm hoping that we, we have a task as scientists um, to inform evidence-based policy so that FEMA's policies can change and other um, supporting agencies' policies can change to help communities when nothing is happening, to prepare when something will be happening. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. If, um, you know, when in the middle of Hurricane Katrina, there was a, a volunteer organization who sent tons of blankets to the community. It's August, it's 100 degrees in New Orleans. What we needed was safe water to drink. And so it's that communication and understanding what the needs are um, is what makes, makes a difference. 
So, and, and again, uh, one of the things which I take away because I, I, I lived through it, not in New Orleans, but, you know, in the United States and as a faculty member in South Carolina, uh, I think 20 years have passed since uh, Rita and Katrina. And one of the things which has improved vastly, and this is what I feel as an academic, is that, you know, there is much greater communication. You know, I don't think uh, those days the internet and Wi-Fi was all very, very, very in its infancy. Now, you know, uh, it, messages and news and information flows through the speed of light and you know we don't have to worry about getting information almost everybody has a smartphone you know 20 years ago you, you had to get a boarding pass to board a plane and now nobody nobody stops anywhere to go to board a plane so let me jump to the second question uh this is all from slido through your comments uh i've heard from several uh, municipal, local flooding managers and planners who are concerned of how outdated the FEMA floodplain maps are. How might national academies or the broader research community support in more frequent, more frequent updating of these boundaries? What do you guys think? And let's flip the order now. Margaret, you go first. You know, what do you think about this this floodplain maps? You know, what what can we do? I mean, we are you know here to assist. The communities. Well, FEMA is working on this, and they're for their future flood risk data initiative. They are trying to get around this problem I mentioned with the hard boundary, suggesting an in-out kind of thing, um, and creating more graduated flood risk information, so property level information. This is also in their risk rating 2.0, which is their initiative to change the way. You pay for your flood insurance. Not all of this is popular because some people's rates are going up, but there's a lot of work at FEMA on, you know, fixing the flood map problem. Um, it's going to, you know, they've been working on this for a while. It's taking a while. Um, risk rating 2.0 is, is, is they're doing that now it's since 2021. Um, but there's a good amount of work. You know, there are also private um, information now. I'm sure people are familiar with uh, flood factor, which is, um, you know, the First Street Foundation, an independent organization, has developed property level flood risk information. And it's they've partnered with Redfin and Realtor.com. So you can go right on there and input your address if you're looking to buy a home and figure out what the, the flood risk is. So things are starting to change in sort of conveying risks better, I would say. Uh, let me add that this is a good example of science and equity-based policy, because one size does not fit all. Um, although there could be general uh, guidelines, it is so important to tailor the investments and the responses and the decisions based on the community's needs. And that tailoring is what will make sure that the investment actually goes further. And so while it might look like initially a larger investment in some communities than others, that investment might go longer because imagine if there is a, well, we don't have to imagine, there are more frequent and more severe hurricanes. So if we invest early and sustainably, we'll be better, we'll have a shorter time to recover physically, not necessarily from a human human health perspective. But if we focus, if we tailor that precision environmental health to those communities that are most vulnerable, that are in that, as Margaret said, the repeated flooding area, how do we help, uh, how do we tailor our policies to those who uh, are most in need? How do we do that? And we do that by integrating the physical data with the human health data. That's what needs to happen more often. It's happening, but it needs to happen more often. Okay, so since I'm a civil engineer, I'll ask this question, which appeared in Slido. Uh, uh, if addressing flooding is controlled by public health, will there be a role for civil engineers, urban planning, landscape architecture, disciplines, which have been working on both the physical and the social infrastructure, and how? Let's start with uh, uh, Maureen. 
You know, I, I'm so glad you brought it up because I'm married to an engineer and we have intense discussions at home whether medicine and public health um, are a science because engineering is a science and the rest is all art. Uh, not so true, right? Um, and so we we have I. I live next to the school here, the School of Public Health is next to the School of Engineering, and we invest together. Uh, and I require that an engineer and a public health professional work together on an issue of environmental health and climate. And we've had fantastic um, seed programs that ultimately re resulted in interventions that make sense. And so it's that transdisciplinary approach to environmental health that we're broadening, whether it's focused on flood or focused on climate, um, that is required. It's not a luxury anymore for a public health professional or an engineer to work in isolation. Absolutely, we not only want to work together, we must, it is a requirement, it's a prerequisite to be meaningful in terms of what it is we are doing in our communities. Margaret? I don't think we have to worry about engineers being shut out. <laughs> I think they're going to play <laughs> really important roles. I'll just leave it at that. I think um, I wasn't sure I quite understood the question, but it sounded like um, the person was asking about um, environmental health and public health playing a bigger role, what that meant for the engineers who played traditionally large roles in this area. And I think engineers are central, so we're going to see plenty of that. Okay, so now the next question is something uh, uh, which I'm engaged in right now. So uh, as most of the people in the audience may know, there is a Nas National Science Foundation funded steps of project called uh, Coastlines and People, COPE. And one of the things we do in that is surveys and working with the communities, not just research, but social science based community outreach and engagement. So one of his questions actually hits at the heart of that. It says, how do we not burden, overburden community residents by expecting them to show up for every community engaged effort, initiative, or study? Because these people have their own lives. They have their own professions. So let's start with Margaret first here. Uh, well, how do we how do we yeah. manage that? How do we manage our expectations? Because you know we are scientists. We want everybody to show up for everything. But that's not the real world. I know it's a really great question and I don't know the answer. You try lots of things and you're trying to not overburden the same people over and over. But I hear this a lot. It is a big issue. Um, you know, I'll just tell one story, which is I also host our, our podcast part time at RFF. And I had um, the director of the Los Angeles County Parks Department on and they've done some really interesting equity related investments in LA County around their park system, which is huge. I mean, LA County is the largest county in the US um, population wise. And she talked about the process for doing this and engaging communities and what they wanted to see. And it's really interesting. You can read the reports on their website, but she talked a lot about what they did. You know, they got, they had meetings at the times that people could come working people, they provided food, they provided childcare, they provide, you make it easy for people to do these things. And that's just the one, you know, we know this from others as well. I just thought when she was on the podcast, she really had an engaging and interesting way to talk about it. And um, I think those are things that are important, but it's an acknowledged hurdle. Um, it's actually Morning. very simple. We, the community, Communities are leaders, communities are scientists too. Uh, we learn from them rather than the opposite way. And so um, we also value them the same way we value other faculty and co-investigators. So communities are, community leaders are always part of anything that I do. And we value them not only by providing food, we value them by paying them. We value because their time is equally or often more important um, than what we bring. Also, there are several, and I, I thank the sponsors for this of this workshop. Uh, more and more, whether it's NIH, NSF, or CDC, are investing in implementation science. And implementation science requires that there is co-creation, co-implementation, and co-benefits. And so, without being able to show that. 
um, you are not, we are not going to get an implementation science grant. And I'm so pleased that um, all of the major funders are now recognizing the importance of implementation science, but particularly the translation of science into um, what makes sense in the community and that community scientists, in fact, one of the grants I actually had, uh, our community leaders develop a curriculum for faculty of how to do community engaged science. And that was fantastic. It was a, was a true learning experience. And so it's the reciprocal enrichment of both of the, both spaces of knowledge and species of implementation that we not only have to respect, but that we have to value in all ways, including value their time. So the next question is, uh, again, you know, given the vast experience between uh, both of you, do you have any examples of local areas, local communities, which are doing a good job with zoning and land use, local land use planning? Because, you know, in the end of the day, I always argue land use is probably the most important thing when it comes to flooding, because being a civil engineer and knowing the meaning of the word infiltration, land use becomes a big issue. So Maureen, starting with you, I mean, and any good examples? I mean, um, of people doing you this? You know, when we, we had that very question, actually, when we um, did the study um, on looking at where, how to, what progress we've made with community resilience. And yes, communities in California keep co coming up. But there are communities um, also in the Midwest, also in the Southeast, there are everywhere, there are communities who did a few things well. One, um, they invested in that social capital, those domains that I talked about. Two, they had leaders, they had government and policy makers that were embedded and committed to making that happen. And three, they had community leaders that were not on the sidelines, but that were in those communities. And so there are, whether it's the United Home Nation or other communities in the Midwest um, or communities here in Pittsburgh, it is that investment in social capital, those six domains that sets one community apart from each other or creates more resilient um, structures that are in place. We tell those stories, we, we, we publicize those stories. Um, you know, a while ago, and some there's there, there's some still, um, Franka, that there are community resilience officers at the city level, and those people did a phenomenal job in integrating those disparate agencies that come together when a when a disaster happens, but integrating them in one place. We need to have more of those resilience officers. Margaret. Well, this is a good question too. Um, hmm. Just being a little more specific about the planning and zoning aspect of that question, and are there communities I think they're asking if, that can be held up as exemplars, you know, and sort of doing some creative approaches to really manage their land uses? Um, I don't know. There's everybody's doing something different, as Maureen said. I would point partly to Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk has one of the worst sea level rise problems on the East Coast, they're faced with a problem. They are, were, I think, one of the first to have a resilience overlay zone. And what that does is create some incentives for, you know, no, not relocating in certain areas and relocating in other areas that are more upland zones, they call them, I think. And um, they're trying to use that overlay zone. And we have overlay zones are a common thing in planning and zoning. They're used for historical areas. They're used for, mm -hmm. for other things. So we do these overlay zones that by themselves, they don't do a lot, but they are signal. And then if you marry them with some other kinds of incentive-based options or you know, carrots mm -hmm. and sticks, mm -hmm. you can make it work. And in Norfolk, they're trying to do this with like, trying to encourage the use of transfer of development rights programs and things like that, that will allow some shifting around. So I would point to Norfolk, Boston has a relative, a newer overlay, resilience overlay zone that they're using. I think time will tell whether these really do a, make a change. Um, I will just put my two cents in that it isn't all about the planning part, but it is also about the regulations and incentives. So plans are great, but they're just plans on paper. And so we need sort of implementation of those plans. 
Awesome. So actually, you mentioned a word in there, which leads to the next question, which you can be the first one to respond to, Margaret. Uh, how can resilience hubs be used to support communities at risk of flooding, especially considering resilience hubs should not be located in a floodplain? You know, you know, when we look at the long history of human uh, civilizations, all human civilizations started on floodplains. But, uh, you know, now we want to move a little bit away. So so what's the role of this resilience hubs and how can they be optimized in their usage? Uh, well, it's not something I'm a big expert on, uh, resilience hubs. I will say that, um, you know, they're they're supposed to be supporting, you know, obviously relatively safer areas for people to you know live work and play and find a way to you know um not be as at risk it's not easy in all communities to find a place for that so you know I know a bit about the Kentucky floods and in Appalachia you have really serious issues trying to figure out where you're going to have resilient locations um so you know that's one thing I'll say is like it's a little bit of Planning the and thinking about these things is good, but I'm not sure how, on a long run, day to day basis, how you get them to the level at which they're going to accomplish what you think what you want them to accomplish. Maybe Maureen has knows more about them and can say more about the um, concept. So but. the the concept of the resilience hub has, has in the past and often been seen very narrow in the physical resilience. So make sure the ways and the bridges and the, you know, but it is when you, resilience has become more beneficial when they deliberately integrate the public health piece, the human health piece. And so you'd have the physical infrastructure piece, the built environment, the sustainability. And I wanted to mention that resilience hubs now also expand into addressing sustainability which is easier in a way to um, envision and it's easier to implement because you can measure it. You know, in, in my world, what and in all of our worlds, in what get measures get done. And so integrating the different pieces that comprise the resilience that or that are vulnerable, um, I think it's a better, more integrated and systems approach. That's what often missing. The, the silo approach is still, um, it's the easier way to go because you don't have to work with each other and talk to each other and um, actually bring the resources together. But it's the systems approach that's most sustainable. And so that's why the world of resilience hubs are increasingly more connected to the sustainability efforts in a specific area. Okay, and the last question goes back to you, Maureen, because you've been... Uh, answering everything so well, both of you. Uh, uh, can you expand on what you meant by community-engaged scholarship? Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, so there is a old paradigm from, it's called the International Association of Public Participation, and it goes from consultation to involvement, to collaboration, to, this, to power. And so often when people say community, oh, I'm working with community X or community Y, all they mean is they, they'll show up and they'll listen and they'll leave and they could do whatever they want with that information. That's consultation or information dissemination. That's not working together. Now, when you get to collaboration, you actually commit that you'll make joint decision making. When you get to all the way to empowering, and a, people, a lot of people like to use the word, and particularly you know, in academia, well, I've empowered the community. No, you haven't, because when you empower a community, you give away all the decisions, and that's not the way we work together. So it's getting to collaboration where you invest in a community, really co-create that research proposal, co-create the implementation roadmap, share the dollars, share the budget, share the accountability too. Go create the evaluation. That's particularly important because often we see seen as promising a lot and doing very little that's useful. So it's that co-creation and co-manage, co-implementation, co-management mm -hmm. and co-evaluation. That's at the core of implementation science. That's community engaged scholarship and nothing mm -hmm. less. 
Thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you so much, Margaret. I mean, this has, uh, you know, set us off on a great trajectory for the remainder of today and for Monday. So now we're going to transition to session number two, which is moderated by one of our wonderful planning committee members, uh, Anilu Njoku, who is an associate professor in the Department of Public Health at Southern Connecticut State University. Anuli, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, um, so welcome to all. We appreciate you taking your time um, today to join this workshop and hope you have found it um, so far to be insightful and um, informative. And so we're going to now um, transition to the next um, part of the workshop today. And, and so the goal of this session, which is shared stories on the ground lived experiences, is to highlight shared experiences through a set of stories in different geographic locations where participants worked directly with affected populations, local communities, state governments, researchers, implementers, associations, and others. So our four excellent storytellers will discuss their experience aligning communities' needs while navigating external expectations, policies, limiting resources, and tools with varying levels of proven eff um, efficacies. All storytellers' bios can be found on our website, and um, I believe the link will be or should be in the chat. So today, each speaker will have seven minutes maximum to tell their story with three minutes of burning questions, if any, which will allow for about 20 minutes of Q&A with audience and all storytellers at the end. And if the planning committee or other storytellers have burning questions, you will have the opportunity to pose it at the end of each presentation. So our first storyteller is Kemp Burdett, who is the Cape Fear River Keeper at Cape Fear River Watch. Um, Kemp, if you can please turn on your camera, unmute yourself and, um, and also share your screen. I would like to remind all that they have seven minutes um, at max for their presentations with three minutes of burning questions right after. Um, so um, Kemp, you can take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, we just make sure that Okay, does that look good to y'all? Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. So um, I live in Southeastern North Carolina uh, on the East Coast, right around where that red circle is. Uh, and I was uh, born and raised in this area. So I've seen over the last 50 years or so uh, firsthand the impacts of climate change. And one of the most impactful uh, changes to the climate is the way uh, climate change relates to hurricanes. And so, you know, in the Atlantic, climate change is actually changing hurricanes. The storms are getting uh, bigger and stronger. Uh, they are carrying more moisture and they're moving more slowly. And so as these storms make landfall uh, and they move inland, communities experience extreme flooding events. Um, and since 1996, the Cape Fear region in southeastern North Carolina has experienced a 500-year uh, storm event, two 1,000-year storm events, and too many 100-year storm events to list here, uh, which I think m maybe speaks to some of the discussion we had in earlier presentations about the need to update uh, how we evaluate floodplains. Uh, the six most destructive of these storms, five of which occurred in the last 40 years uh, and two of which occurred in the last eight years, killed 137 people in North Carolina and caused close to $50 billion in damages in North Carolina alone uh, in today's dollars. So storm surge and high winds get a lot of attention uh, when hurricanes come, but I'm going to focus more on inland impacts uh, from hurricanes, focusing on Hurricane Florence, uh, which made landfall in September of 2018. Um, Florence made landfall uh, here near uh, Cape Fear uh, and moved northwest, kind of in this direction where the where the circle area is 
directly up the Cape Fear watershed and dropped as much as 36 inches of rain in some places. Um, river flooding was extensive um, and the relatively flat landscape here in North Carolina was completely covered in floodwaters. Uh, so this is a, a illustration of that. This is a bridge in Fayetteville, North Carolina during normal conditions. Uh, you can see the boats down here. Uh, this is that bridge during flooding from Hurricane Florence. Uh, entire communities in eastern North Carolina were isolated by flooded roadways and washed out bridges. So people couldn't leave their communities and assistance couldn't get to those communities. Um, so the Cape Fear Basin that I showed you in an earlier map is North Carolina's largest watershed. It's larger than the state of New Jersey. Uh, and it's also the state's most industrialized watershed. And so virtually every industry in the basin experienced significant negative storm impacts. Uh, the leading industry in the Cape Fear Basin is agriculture, specifically uh, animal factory farms where hogs and chickens are housed. Uh, indoors uh, for the entirety of their lives in tightly packed buildings, which of course concentrates uh, the waste from those uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of animals. North Carolina is the nation's leading producer of poultry and the nation's second leading producer of uh, hogs. Hog waste is collected in these giant uh, open cesspools, like you see in this image here. Chicken waste is collected in giant piles, which are frequently left out on fields. Other industrial sites impacted by Hurricane Florence uh, in the Cape Fear Basin include uh, two separate uh, coal ash storage areas, uh, one near the top of the basin and one near the bottom, wastewater treatment plants, um, chemical manufacturing plants, slaughterhouses, paper mills, junkyards, and landfills. So flood water inundated uh, hog waste cesspools, overwashed these giant piles of poultry waste. It overwhelmed municipal wastewater treatment infrastructure. It ruptured coal ash ponds uh, and, and washed that coal ash into waterways. It washed through junkyards and landfills. It covered wastewater settling ponds and it covered uh, remediation sites at industry. And all of that waste flooded through communities. It, it flooded through homes and schools, uh, through churches, daycare centers, nursing homes. Uh, you can see here an image of a poultry facility with the water flowing out down through this community. That flood water carried pathogens from untreated human waste and animal waste, heavy metals from coal ash, PFAS chemicals from chemical manufacturing plants, petroleum and other chemicals from junkyards and landfills. And that animal waste combined with human waste and natural sources of organic materials uh, and, and quickly decomposed and that process uh, reduced dissolved oxygen in, in the Cape Fear River to zero, uh, resulting in enormous fish kills. And the stench in these communities from this combination of, of pollution was unbearable. I can tell you from, from personal experience. Uh, when floodwaters began to recede, um, you know, you had soggy homes and schools and buildings uh, with no power. In September, it's hot here in September, uh, and those structures cooked in the September heat and black mold started to set in. Um, people who returned to their property faced a myriad of health concerns, uh, bacteria and other pathogens from millions of drowned livestock and their waste combined with human waste, respiratory impacts, uh, and high levels of from black mold and high levels of toxic pollutants. Attempts to access and remediate damaged property led to cuts and scrapes, uh, with high risk of infection. And of course, the mental health challenges of dealing with a disaster of this scale. Uh, private wells were covered with polluted floodwaters for days or weeks, leading to contaminated water supplies. Entire neighborhoods um, mucked out homes, and these enormous piles of garbage grew on roadsides and stayed in place for months. Many families lost everything. 
uh, flooding from Florence covered homes that had never been flooded before. And, and many of those folks didn't have flood insurance. Um, and in my area, there are still hundreds of properties that sit deserted and rotting, uh, and, and rebuilding efforts in North Carolina have been largely criticized as failures. And of course, tragically, the people who have suffered the most uh, in Florence were the people who were least able to bounce back from disasters. So last slide, the lessons learned. I say maybe because we seem to have a very short memory around, um, around flooding events. There's, there's frequently a lot of energy here after a big flood to, to do what needs to be done to, to make our community more resilient and to, to prevent these disasters from happening again. Uh, and that energy seems to fade fairly quickly. I hope that we learn that climate change is, is making hurricane impacts worse and that we need to plan now before the next storm. I hope that we have learned that floodplain assessment in North Carolina is inaccurate and needs to be updated. Uh, and, and that a lot of that inaccuracy, I will just say, is, is intentional in North Carolina and is driven by interests that, that want to develop in floodplains and push back very hard against um, changing the way we evaluate the risk in those floodplains. I hope that we learn that building or keeping or rebuilding hazardous industry in floodplains threatens public health. I hope we learn that allowing or encouraging residential development, new residential development, uh, in, in floodplains, floodplains that are designated accurately only sets people up for eventual disaster. It's not a, it's not an if situation, it's a when situation here. Impacts are flooding um, are felt long after water recedes. So health impacts are felt long, you know, months and even years after the storms have passed. Um, impacts from large floods should be looked at cumulatively and not separately. Uh, so it's a combination of of you know the loss of housing and the and the contamination of water and the mental health challenges, uh, and then finally our response to disasters so far in North Carolina has been inadequate and people suffer needlessly because of that, uh, and that's especially true in communities, uh, low wealth communities and communities of color. Thank you. Thank you, Kemp, for sharing your story. A very compelling story. Um, are there any burning questions from the committee members or other storytellers? Um, if not, um, I can pose a question. Um, in the interest of time, so I, I would, I would, I'll just kind of pose some, a question to you, um, Kemp. So like I mentioned, very compelling. So many things kind of I was thinking about as you were presenting um, just even the terms 1,000 year storm event or 100 year storm event, which just shows how um, you know pressing the issue is. Um, the other thing I thought about that could probably um, relate to the previous speakers in this uh, workshop was you mentioned that North Carolina being the leading uh, producer of poultry and also second leading producer of um, hogs. And I thought about um, possible uh, food insecurity issues as a result. I was wondering if you want to comment on any of those effects as it related to um, uh, these events. Yeah, you know, I think the concern is is less with these large industrial size farms, you know, which which export a lot of of what they produce. I think the concern is less about food insecurity because of flooded farms, although, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of animals died in in the flood inside those barns, but it's more about the impacts of of that kind of activity in the floodplain on people downstream that really is concerning less about the the food insecurity there in my opinion anyway i see uh, just to add to that the environmental justice issue you mentioned the communities surrounding were um, least likely to bounce back and you know they were probably also um, more likely to be um more adversely affected by these so you know in terms of maybe their their food supply um and things of that nature and you know um you mentioned things such as the the black mold you mentioned i think that the types of uh, toxins that were uh, spilling into the communities were pretty striking so things like path pathogens you mentioned pfas you mentioned um petroleum from landfills and animal waste so i think uh, that's also something that's very telling that the fact that the area, the communities that are least likely to be able to respond were also um, inequitably exposed to these uh, toxins that were spilling from the events. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the you know, North Carolina has, Eastern North Carolina is is covered by wide 
floodplains and, and these large rivers that drain east uh, towards the Atlantic. And, and, you know, that's where the worst damage happens. And that also happens to be where a lot of environmental justice communities are located. And so, uh, the, you know, they, they deal with these things. Things on a daily basis, those effects are, you know, multiplied exponentially. So exposure to the to the pollution from industrial facilities in the floodplain is is expanded. I mean, to the point where that pollution washes through your home and soaks into, you know, your your carpet. And, you know, it it's a it, it is always a tough situation uh, for for environmental justice communities in North Carolina and hurricanes make it, you know, impossible. Indeed. Um, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. Uh, we're going to go now to the second storyteller. And uh, the second storyteller is Ramona Taylor Williams, who is the executive director of the Mississippi Communities United for Prosperity. Ramona, please turn on your camera, unmute yourself and um, share your screen. Good morning. So everyone. Ramona. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us here to tell our story um, about um, MCAP, the uh, Mississippi Communities United for Prosperity, and the work that we have done uh, in a small community in Mississippi, uh, in central Mississippi, Duck Hill, Mississippi, that is sits 100 miles north of Jackson and 100 miles south of uh, Memphis. And the Duck Hill community had been flooding for mud for, for decades. And we were fortunate to receive $300,000 in funding from the Southeastern Sustainability Directors Network to develop an initiative that we coined Achieving Sustainability Through Education and Economic Development Solutions Succeeds. And we developed a water diversion system um, to um, help to mitigate the flooding using both green and gray infrastructure technology. We also work closely with the communities to um, look at their communities from um, um, to, through the lens of community and economic development. However, before we could move into the economic development, community and economic development phases, we had to address the issue of flooding. And we were very successful. Uh, the town of Duck Hill no longer floods. And the motto, a seeds motto, gained national attention from um, the EP from uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. So that's what we're featuring here on this particular slide. That was in 2018. Uh, we started the work in 2018, and that went through 2020 just before COVID hit. But I want to talk a little bit about where our current work is because we centered our work in the rural areas, uh, not thinking that we were going to um, look at the urban, the urban centers. I live in the city of Jackson. And however, when we ran into the, um, the water crisis back in 2022, uh, I, had, it, it, I had to take a different approach towards our work. And we looked at the city of Jackson once we learned that uh, what actually caused the system, the water treatment system to collapse was flooding. We knew that we would not be able to have the impact or the resources to look at the city as a whole. So what we did was we selected three communities that we would focus on uh, using the ACEEDS model from Duck Hill, uh, using that model to look at how we would be able to create a sustainability plan. I'd like to talk a little bit, uh, Charles, if you could uh, put up our next slides. I want to talk a little bit about how the um, our work as 
frontline community organizations. We realize our limited capacity to address major issues such as flooding. And so we rely very heavily on developing strategic partnerships where we will be able to do as the previous speaker uh, said in the last session, Maureen, how we will be able to tackle major issues such as flooding in particular in the city of Jackson. So anchor institutions like universities play a significant role in helping us to build our capacity to challenge these kinds of issues. So we were fortunate to partner with Columbia University, the School of Sustain um, Climate and Sustainability. And one of the things that we looked at was these three communities. There were um, three different communities that had three different neighborhood associations and those neighborhood associations were not talking to one another. So the first thing that we wanted to do was bring the communities together so that they would begin to talk about a common issue, develop a common agenda. Of course, the common agenda was flooding because these three communities significantly flood when the Pearl River spills over into the Ross Barnett Reservoir. When the reservoir reaches its capacity, they open the floodgates and then those they discharge those waters downstream and it floods out these three communities. One of the things that I kind of see this as being is that they create many uh, Katrinas uh, and um, to save the homes along the reservoir. So we looked at a sustainability plan initially um, but we realized that the communities weren't quite ready for the sustainability plan because we needed to bring them together. So uh, we work with the students at Columbia, uh, sustain a fourth year sustainability students, and we developed a comprehensive community um, communications plan. So we are in our fourth cohort of students. So we've gone through many reiterations uh, or community organizing, engaging community. We formed a community advisory board and that community advisory board is focusing on the Army Corps of Engin Engineers, uh, what's called uh, labeled as the One Lake Plan. And so communities have been excluded. These are um, communities of color and they have been excluded during a 15 year planning process around this whole one lake plan. So um, we said, well, okay, community needs to have a plan of its own. So we worked with the students uh, this semester and we have developed the sustainability plan. What you see on the right was uh, a product that was developed by last semester's students and they um, developed a problem tree and this is the problem tree. So this, uh, this um, and that work from the other three cohorts has influenced our ultimate sustainability plan that we are working on now. Um, why a sustainability plan? It reduces flood, re uh, the flood reduction plan, which we all know that it is not enough. Uh, plan management governance is a systemic issues with multiple competing goals and no clear definition of what success looks like. We want things, we want success out of this. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, we want to think and rethink how uh, planning for sustainability, how it works. Uh, the old way was that, you know, you've got the city planning department and all of the players to the exclusion of our communities. So we want to change that uh, trajectory and make it more community centered and more community driven. The next slide, please, Charles. Um, now we're moving in the process of moving towards developing our sustainability plan. Uh, the other uh, um, cohorts of students, we developed a, a comprehensive communications plan. 
uh, survey because we wanted to get a better uh, understanding of what residents were facing uh, and, and from also from a public health perspective. And we also did the problem mapping. Uh, what we are doing now is reviewing the literature around uh, nature-based solutions for planning and uh, developing a work plan and these are the different phases. Our next step is now we are focusing on formalizing the sustainability plan, uh, implementing the survey that has been developed, identifying funding resources, um, and also those strategic partnerships, and then just keep continuing to address the main issues that have come out of the many community engagement and forums that we have held. Next slide, please. Um, we looked at what kind of tools do community need in order to develop a nature-based um, sustainability plan. And we looked at various nature-based solutions, leveraging the nat natural environment, such as the wetlands and native vegetation to manage flooding and enhance resiliency against extreme weather events. We also wanted to address the economic interventions um, and so, and we wanted to look at, um, we really wanted this model to be not only centered on um, the heavy flood mitigation part, but also, okay, we're past our time. But um, the main thing that we want to highlight here is the importance of having strategic partners and our number one partners being the universities and the anchor institutions because they bring so much resources, um, intelligence to the work that we are doing in order to make our community safer, healthier, and more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona, for that very insightful um, presentation. And um, so I'll, I'll remind viewers, we will um, be collecting um, questions um, for Q&A after in the Slido. So please add your um, questions there. So thank you again, Ramona. I think a, a salient part of your presentation was when you mentioned rethinking the plan for sustainability and the fact that there is that resident um, academic and um, government partnerships. So um, we appreciate that. And um, so we're gonna go on to the next um, storyteller. And so our next storyteller is Ab Abigail um, Matos Pagan, who is a disaster nurse at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagas. Um, Abigail, if you can please turn on your camera, unmute yourself and share your screen. And um, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you to all. I don't know what happened. It took me out. It took my my um took me out of the uh, room. Mm -hmm. Give me a second. I don't know what happened. There. Oh, yeah. We we can see your presentation oh, and hear you. Yeah. Okay. Your your volume's a little low though. Great. Can you see? Can you see the uh, presentation? Yes, we can see it. You can just put it in presentation mode, and you'll be good to go. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. And you will want to swap the display settings to yes. swap. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Is that You're okay? All right. All good. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, happy to be here with you all. Great presentations. I uh, was relating to everything that you said. And Kemp, I just wanted to let you know that I was in Florence responding to, to uh, I was in North Carolina responding to uh, Florence when, when it happened. And and one of the things that I that I saw that was very very similar to what I'm going to share with you today is um, the elderly population that we saw there was in, increasingly high and almost the same thing that we saw here. Um, 
uh, I want to present to you what what is our experience and what how we did it and 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 what we did, our interventions, the outcomes and the conclusions, and what we learned about all of this. Um, just like many of you said, uh, I am in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a very small island here in the Caribbean, and we are at risk of hurricanes and storms and flooding all year round, basically. But we've had uh, five, in the past five, the last five years, we've had uh, five storms and hurricanes that, that really took a lot of us. Uh, one of them, everybody knows about Hurricane Maria in 2017, which caused catastrophic flooding across the, the whole island. And, 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 it, and it caused extensive damage to the infrastructure, to homes, to businesses, um, it resulted in, in a lot of loss of life and long-term power out outages that lasted six and six months and one year. And we still are suffering from that power out outage. Um, the floods of, of 2019, uh, which was a very heavy rainfall, uh, causing a lot of flooding also in some parts of the island. Um, it caused a lot of uh, evacuations and road closures and damage also to the in infrastructure. The tropical storm Isaias in 2020 also caused significant flooding and a lot of mudslides in, in the mountain. And it resulted in a lot of uh, damage to all the roads and bridges. Many of the communities were uncommunicated and, and, it, and it was hard to get to them and to assist them. In September 2022, just five years after Hurricane Maria, it all happened again with 30 inches of rain, heavy rainfall in the southern and central region of Puerto Rico, causing a significant flooding that caused a lot of collapse of roads and bridges and homes, and again, problems with the power with the power grid. That is something that we here in Puerto Rico are um, very, very, um, with the, with the trauma to lose our power. Um, all we know that this is the island of Puerto Rico and all the coastal areas that you see here in blue are the, uh, the, the main risk of flooding because in the center of the island, there's a big range of mountains that the rivers all drain to that, to that area. Unfortunately, those are the areas that are most populated. Um, and so they, they receive a lot of, um, of those waters and rivers flooding their homes and their communities. So those consequences that we see in the coastal areas are infrastructure damage and property destruction and a lot of financial losses with a lot of health risks. Health risks that are acute problems and that are chronic problems and long-term problems, increasing morbidity and mortality and um, and we saw that in 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 Maria. A lot of displaced displacement of people, but the only problem that we have at maybe maybe different than the than the that the United States is that we don't have anywhere to go. we we're, we're just a little island, so we can just move to another state. I mean, we we can, but um, we can't we can't move immediately, right? Um, so the displacement, those two shelters or to family home or to another community, but basically everything is flooded. So it is it is very difficult. And there's a lot of disruption of essential services. Services that are so important to the community, services like hospitals. In Maria, we did not have um for for maybe two weeks we didn't have we didn't have hospitals available for in the so um, when we look at the hurricanes and the problems that they bring with, with flooding, uh, we see that there's also problems with storm surge and tidal waves that also um, flood the, all the coastal uh, areas with six to nine feet above ground level. Uh, also the rainfall and the, and the flooding that we get or we got in those two um, storms were more than 25 to 30 inches of uh, of rain. 
those caused a lot of flooding and mudslides, and those were basically uh, the, the, the most problems to our people and to get to where they had to go. They could not get out of their homes and they could not um, get any assistance either. We have a problem, it's a cultural problem. People don't wanna leave their homes. People wanna stay. So how do, how do you convince them when they're, when they're living in a flooded area, they know it. And they've had flooding before, the year before, the year before, but they don't wanna move because that's the only thing they have or because that's a sentimental value for them. So in, in healthcare, we had a lot of infrastructure problems. Um, almost uh, all hospitals in, in the RIA were damaged by, by the hurricane itself and then by the outage of the power grid. Then we could not find diesel for all those 79 hospitals that were out um, and a lot of competition for that diesel, uh, companies and, and organizations that needed that too. So um, the hospitals were closed and shut down uh, because of that shortage of diesel. As a consequence also, we have um, some pharmaceutical companies that do IV fluids and there was a really shortage of IV fluids in the states also in the, in, in the nation um, because the company had a lot of damage. So we could not find IV fluids for, uh, for, for some time. And of course, the worst probably, it was a communication system that failed. Um, we did not have communication at all. Um, and, and, and it was uh, like maybe five or six days before we could get any communication with someone out of the island. Um, but inside the island, not even the satellites worked. Um, I was working with uh, the National Disaster Medical System I, and, and I stayed here in Puerto Rico um, and we could not communicate with the satellite. It was very difficult. I mean, it, it, it had a lot of um, inconveniences. We had death toll that, that were very high and very uh, um, different with everybody that made the, uh, the analysis. But we had drownings and injuries and medical emergency that could not be attended. Um, and of course, the indirect uh, causes of death, uh, lack of prescription medicine, all the pharmacies were closed. We could not find any pharmacy open. And when they opened, um, they could not re we uh, we pack their their um, their medication or their prescriptions for the public. Uh, insulin was a problem. We could not find insulin, and there was a lot of cardiovascular events uh, where people died of myocardial infarct at their home, um, and the the ambulance could not get there. Uh, and of course, the hospital generator, like I said, failure was was a big big problem. Right here on the bottom, you can see um, the death toll and um, Harvard University made a study and they they decided that it was 4,000 people who died. And then George Washington said probably 3,000, but I would go more with Harvard University because I saw a lot of death, direct death and indirect death. Um, we have, we have, and we, we still have a lot of vulnerable population. Um, our elderly population in Puerto Rico is growing and it's right now approximately 20, 24% of the population. And the younger people are moving out. So um, there's there's a lot of problems with, with our elderly who takes care of them. Um, and they are at home by themselves alone. So when things happen, um, they are right there. They, they don't have anybody to help sometimes. So, and they die and they die by themselves. The children, when, um, when I was deployed to, to help out in the, in the, in the mountains and in, in the countryside, um, they were, they appeared to be unbothered. They, they, they looked like they were happy. Of course, we had a lot of, um, uh, of help and assistance and resources from from the United States government. So 
uh, they were amazed of all the helicopters and all the soldiers and all the people that were trying to help. But um, uh, many of our elderly in those areas were were unable to look for, for food, for water, for medication. And um, like, like they said, they were there unattended and, 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 and it was hard for them. The renal patients that we have, we have a lot of renal patients that, that get hemodialysis and they were unable to get the treatment and, and they were, um, it was very scarce for them to go and have an hour or two hours of hemodialysis. And also because they could not get to the center. So diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, um, they did not have their medication and they could not get their di regular diet, low sodium. Um, what they were getting was the MREs. Those are military foods that are specially packed in a little pouch with a lot of preservatives and sodium and a lot of calories. Uh, but sometimes one of those little pouches can have 3,000 calories, and that's what they were eating. And of course, uh, it, it was it was new to a lot of the population, and they were like eating that maybe three times a day. So um, it, we had a lot of problems with with the uh, with uh, hypertension and and heart failure patients. The people that would bed that was bedridden and uh, suffered from extreme heat because we did not have no fans, no air conditioning, no power, so they were uh, in a lot of heat and, and there was no clean water uh, and they couldn't get any electrical support for oxygen or or maybe um, and and maybe it sounds a little exaggerated but. Um, it was it was very very hard for um, for us for these patients to to get the equipment that they needed. Maybe uh, two, three, four, five, six days. It's eternity for them. So this picture I took I took myself, and, and it's very interesting that um, you can see those two persons there um, hugging in and. We saw a lot of despair and distress, a lot of isolation, a lot of anxiety. But at the same time, we could see a lot of signs of resiliency, of neighbors helping each other, of phone and food yeah. sharing. Abigail, sorry to interrupt. Um, we are um, a little bit over um, time, but um, oh. so, um, and we have one more um, uh, speaker, but so. Um, if you can just uh, try to just maybe wrap up in 60 seconds and then we'll sure, sure, jump on. Sure. Okay. The people's experience, um, as you can see uh, by the pictures, uh, they, they were suffering and they had a lot to do uh, with, with what they, what the response and what we did, uh, there was a lot of local help, uh, community leaders that helped with the, uh, with the, um, response municipal and federal the federal government sent a lot of um 10,000 federal workers came to the island to work and the department of defense um, brought 9,000 military personnel and there was a coalition of healthcare professionals that provided at home services to all those people that could not come we have we had a lot of health impact we still have them and every time there is a a storm and a flood uh, we, we see those health impacts, contamination of water, sewage, chemical, and other pollutants, outbreak of hepatitis A, increase of leptospirosis, mosquitoes and other vectors, dengue, especially the mold that you all mentioned also, um, that, that mold that brings a lot of uh, respiratory problems, allergies, and asthma. We see physical injuries like cuts and bruises and fractures and drowning and indirect death. Um, we also see mental health effects like anxiety, stress, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, the increase of morbidity and mortality from those chronic um, diseases. Um, so what do we take away from this and from these experiences? Um, flooding, flooding events in Puerto Rico, they're the every day we have to look at them as something that we live and that we should um, learn from each experience. We need to improve in our infrastructure. 
our communication um, system and power grid, and of course, the response teams, people, resources, right? Education in disasters, probably from elementary to high, uh, higher education. I think we should include that topic in every school because that's important. The more you learn from it every single day, that's that's a habit and you learn how to how to do things that are different. So also communication, which is crucial. Um, we didn't have that backup system. Now we do and we we're getting better at that. And also prepare for the worst for water supply, food, medication, um, and have a registry of the those uh, people that are bedridden and disabled so that we can at least help them and get to get out and uh, prepare for the extended periods of, of power outage. Uh, you have to okay. consider also uh, the burnout factor of yeah. responders and be attentive to the signs and symptoms of heat, fatigue, and anxiety, depression, or worsen in mental status. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. And I'll take the questions maybe later. Or okay. Um, yes, I think we'll hold that to the end. So um, thank you, Abigail, for your poignant conversation. Um, I believe we are going till um, possibly about 2.15. So we'll have one more speaker and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes after for um, Q&A. So I'd like to introduce our next storyteller. Um, and that is me, Pickering. Um, with the Appalachian Media Institute project, and she's a project director at Apple Shop. So uh, Mimi, I see you on camera, um, so the floor is yours. Okay, great. <clears throat> yes, I'm with Apple Shop. We are a 50-year-old media arts and education center located in the um, East Kentucky coal fields in central Appalachia. And as a, I'm a filmmaker, and I have done documentaries about the Buffalo Creek disaster in 1972, in which 125 people were killed. Um, we've worked on documentaries in rural um, Louisiana and Mississippi after Katrina and Rita. And then of course, most recently, we had this horrendous flood in my um, hometown of Whites, well, not just Whitesburg, Eastern Kentucky. And this behind me is downtown Whitesburg. And um, I wanted to show some clips from a film that I worked on with um, the Center for Rural Strategies, trying to kind of immediately after the flood, um, um, share stories of what people had gone through. So here are some, some of the stories from some of the volunteers and survivors of the flood. We're just gonna show a uh, short clip, so go for it. Hopefully it'll work. Water in here came all the way up to this. So this whole house was basically filled with water. There's a woman that lived here. She needs a walker to get around. And she held on to the top of her porch, floating in the water for five hours until someone was able to come and rescue her. And she's old. she's in her late 70s. I thought that after a flood like this, that there would be like boots on the ground. The government comes and Hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you or whatever. But it was a learning process where eventually it set in that, that, that there was really no help coming, and at least not in that form. Uh, people coming and doing this business of mucking houses out and getting all of the things out and then gutting the walls and then applying you know, mold killer. That was just us learning and watching YouTube videos on how to do it. And that is kind of a shocking Thing to realize that it's a sort of ragtag group of volunteers doing it. Just seeing the need, the need was just so grand and still is. Yeah. It's just overwhelming and you know it's just hard to, could be hard to make decisions like okay well, which house do we go to? One of the things people say is how they're just so grateful and, and thankful that they didn't 
lose their life or lose a loved one. Most of us agree that human lives are more important than tangible objects. I think it should still be reminded that tangible objects do connect us to people and, and memories. While we were doing the cleanup crews, uh, folks were also still coming into our mutual aid headquarters to get different supplies that we had on hand. And we were also giving cash out the door um, to folks who needed it. Uh, it was really obvious a lot of people had difficulty in asking for that help and receiving that help. You know, one thing that I learned real quick was to make it very clear that it was not my money that I was giving to people. You know, I think that made people more willing to accept the cash. You know, one thing that was really difficult was just people saying how ashamed they were. And that was really hard because it's like, it's not their fault. There's nothing about this that's their fault. So that was really hard and trying to just try and alleviate that feeling of shame that people felt. I guess you could say that there is a part of that that is good in the sense that, you know, it's neighbors helping neighbors and a community helping out. But at the same time, like we only have so many resources and volunteers and we eventually hit a point where we were very exhausted and we ran out of volunteers. And uh, it just speaks to the need of, you know, institutions with greater resources and money and, and manpower to be available to help during times like this. It, it makes you sad. I mean, you know, I'm gonna go back there and I'm gonna get up every morning, look out the door, and you're gonna see family that's gone, friends that, you know, their house is level. It kinda, it kinda reminds you of a ghost town. Uh, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, I'd rather people move stuff back. A lot of them says they may, a lot of them says they may not. So it's just one of them things that you have to wait and see what they're going to do. I just don't want people to move away. The people who stayed have been so brave to try and stay, you know, and to find, and we, we can do a lot with a little here. We always have been able to. And for those who are moving away, I, I get it, you know, I understand, but I just hope that we can find a way to build housing up off of the creeks floodproof our bridges and use this disaster as, instead of the end of us, as a catalyst for a new beginning to look at everything that makes it hard to live in Eastern Kentucky and fix it. I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I had a few points and of course, uh, they are very basic and generalized and, and, you know, I just want to echo and, and reinforce what both Maureen and, uh, Margaret said. I think what they talked about and their experiences, um, are, are ones that I, as just a, uh, not a expert, but have experienced. And I think, um, you know, we, we, um, we do well to listen to them and take their advice. And so we're still um, very much trying to recover here in Eastern Kentucky. And um, it's gonna be a long haul, but appreciate it. I put in the chat the um, a link to the full 30 minute East Kentucky flood and some other videos about that and, and the Buffalo Creek disaster, which was where the whole notion of PTSD really um, moved into the medical diagnosis um, because of, of what happened there later. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, Mimi, once again, very um, insightful. So we have about, I would say two or three minutes. So what I thought I'd do, there's some great questions in the chat. I'm just going to maybe just cut, try to combine it into one question that um, if each of the speakers can take about maybe a minute or so to just um, respond to. I will start with um, Mimi, since you just finished your presentation. 
Um, and I was wondering if you can comment on whether or not um, any of the health effects of these communities are being tracked, um, if there's any liability for commercial businesses, and also maybe what you might think are some best practices. So kind of a three-part question, maybe a 60 sec second response. Um, I, I'm not sure if it, things are being tracked, but I would guess that, you know, the University of Kentucky has done a lot of research projects in our area, as have other um, schools. And I would, I would imagine that they are, of course, you know, mental health services in our area are pretty limited and, and low resource. So, you know, that's, it's, um, and people don't tend to use them as much as they should. So, there may be some real gaps. Um, and, and as I said, I think a lot of these, you know, the, the trauma, the PTSD kind of surfaces later, not immediately. So it will be um, really good to track. In terms of liability for the flood, there are definitely some um, citizens and some lawyers who think that the massive amounts of strip mining, mountaintop removal mining had a big impact on um, hillsides that couldn't hold the, the the this you know tons of rainwater and and led to um, part of the flooding and so there may be some lawsuits around that and um, I can't remember the third question I'll just let you move it on to the next okay. person uh, best what would you say are best practices for decision makers like if you had to suggest what would be a best practice um, to address this well, issue. Yeah, I think that that as you know, I think Maureen and and Margaret both said it's really involving people, involving you know people on the grassroots level who are most directly impacted by these events, and also can really articulate you know what what the issues are. Like you know, these are folks in Eastern Kentucky, some of them who've been on their families have been on that land for seven generations, and it's going to be very difficult for them to you know, to move to a higher ground community. And, um, you know, that needs to be understood. And you understand that by by being with people and talking to them and really exploring what, you know, what their issues are. And great. we, you know, we, uh, thank you. For some of that is happening. And we've, you know, our governor has really been great in responding and doing everything he can. Our legislature, not so much, but... <laughs> You know, we 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 have had some resources that are helping for sure. Great, that was really insightful. And so I'm going to turn that question next to um, our um, other speakers too, as well. Um, Kemp, if you can possibly have a 60, 60 second response to the same question. So, if any of the health effects of this issue are being tracked, um, if, if there's any liability for commercial businesses and also what you might see are best practices for lawmakers and decision makers. Okay, uh, so my house was flooded badly. I lived in a particularly bad area. I had to muck out my house. My house had to be raised. Um, so I did all that. I've never once been contacted by anyone uh, to, to inquire about health impacts, mental health impacts, uh, anything like that. So I would have to say that uh, from my experience and what I know about my community, that there's been absolutely no effort to track uh, the health effects associated with hurricanes, except for possibly like an academic, uh, um, you know, effort to to do this on a, on a very academic st scale. But as far as actually helping people and changing policy, my experience is no. Um, same, same answer for our, our industries whose pollution leaves their site during these floods and impacts communities downstream, are they held accountable? I, I no, they are not. Um, and, and we are continuing to build those same industries today in floodplains. Uh, and so, um, we, we haven't learned our lesson there either. And I also don't remember the last part of the question. Best practices. <laughs> so, um, Best practices. Um, yeah, I mean, I th I think we need to recognize the scope of 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 impacts from climate change and climate change driven flooding on communities and respond accordingly, which is going to be, which is going to require huge federal uh, f funding 
mechanisms to to you know buy out risky properties in floodplains to help people relocate to to you know help people do what they can to flood proof property that they can't leave uh so i think it's going to take a, a huge federal response before we see significant change because i think often states are unwilling or unable to do it thanks yeah, thank you and then if abigail is available um 60 second response to the same question. So um, any health effects that are tracked, um, any liability for any area businesses? I think you're on mute. Seconds are gone. Um, especially the uh, mental health area, um, it, it's being tracked by mental health programs at different universities here in Puerto Rico, and also by the government and the organization uh, for mental health, because that's one of the areas that most, most was impacted. And um, I remember the last question, collaboration, um, best practices. We are getting uh, a lot of collaboration between different organizations and professionals. Uh, with the intentions to improve the response, to improve um, preparedness. So hopefully uh, we'll improve in, 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 in all that, the mitigation and all that. But um, it's like they said, it, we, need a, we need more help. We need more funds we need. But yes, we're doing that. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to um, all of our speakers for just um, very um, informative presentations. I think the takeaway is that the effects are far reaching. So not just the health effects, I heard psychosocial impacts, I heard, um, and the factors are also behavioral, they're social, they're cultural. Um, and so, and also thank you for the um, suggestions that you have provided as well. And um, so um, once again, I think we are at time, but I'll wait to get a cue from Audrey. Can you tell us how we're doing on time? Okay, while we wait for Audrey, um, uh, Ramona, I was gonna ask if you had a 60 second response as well while we wait for Audrey, just in terms of uh, same questions, um, any health effects that are being attract um, and also any best practices that you can think of. We are looking at the health impact of flooding on lead um, on children from a public health perspective as the waters come in it brings in the heavy metals and we have an initiative called Mississippi Zero Lead and Healthy Housing Initiative. Uh, as far as best practices, of course, I'm going to toot our own our horn, our own horn for the seeds model uh, that is being now looked at as a national model for a, a sustainability for um, for, uh, for uh, frontline communities. Um, the impacts on businesses when. The floodwaters come in and they shut down our water system. It has a significant economic impact on our local businesses and just our communities as a whole. So absolutely, there is a significant um, economic burden on our on our on our businesses. Understandably, Wait, hello. Hello, this is Charles Anuli. Um, we are going to delay um, the the break five minutes, so we, you can um, proceed for another two minutes, and then we will then return uh, for the five minute break at two twenty five p.m. Okay, that's great. I'm glad that we have more um, time so that we can. I mean, these have been very compelling stories. So the fact that we get a few more minutes is great. Um, are there any um, questions from the storytellers that would like to um, ask a fellow storyteller? I think I'll start there to see if there's any burning questions you have for anyone on the panel. Um, if not, um, there was a question I actually had for um, Abigail. I thought it was really uh, moving that you said um, people are still suffering um, when you mentioned Hurricane Katrina happening in 2017. And so I thought that's, you know, seven years ago. So the fact that you mentioned Maria, the word Maria. still. I said Maria. Uh, uh, oh, Maria. Hurricane Maria? Yes. Hurricane right. Maria in 2017. Yes. 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 They so are, the they are still, still suffering. suffering. Yes. There, there's mm -hmm. still a lot of people without, without power, without electrical power. They're, and we have a lot of... Um, um, alternative um, electricity methods, but um, there are still a lot of people that can't afford those. So yes, there's a lot. I can imagine. 
Thank you for the And I have a follow-up question. You're welcome. I have a follow-up question for you, Abigail, which um, others can chime in if they'd like. Um, I also thought it was pretty um, salient that you talked about people don't want to leave their homes. So I right. wondered what kind of factors, if there are any cultural factors that you want to speak on. And then um, after, I'd like to ask anyone else on the panel if they would like to also respond to that. So those people not wanting to leave their homes. Yes, that's right. People that live there all their lives, they, they don't want to leave what they what they worked for. And and may, many of those of them are owners of the of that land and they don't want to leave. They they think that that's the only thing they have. Yes. Yeah, and, and I would add, you know, that, yeah, that, um, you know, as I said, people in the Appalachians, sometimes their families go back generations and generations and generations. And, you know, the land is so important to them. And um, so it's, it's, you know, ama amazing value in that sense and very hard to leave. And there, you know, there might be a family cemetery just a little bit up the hill, um, just so many connections. And then there's just you know, um, also, where are you going to go? Where are you going to get the resources to rebuild? Um, you know, even if FEMA does a buyout, um, will that be enough, you know, enough money to, to start all over again? There just, there's so many issues involved. We are, we're facing, um, like in Letcher County, we've got for maybe 200, they're estimating 200 FEMA buyouts. So, um, you know, it's it's going to have a, a pretty big impact. And that's also one of the issues that we are toiling with now in our 3C, 1CA communities um, and the Army Corps of Engineers flood management slash one lake plan. Um, these communities were developed and they should never have been developed. So the only option may be a buyout, and but how do you how do you relocate an entire culture? You know, so someone had talked about the culture dislocation. So that's one of the things that our community advisory board is taking under consideration now, and having those conversations in the event uh, the buyout is, of course, it's got. It's going to be the last solution, but some of the properties and the homes are just so at risk uh, for flooding. It may be the only option and the best solution. So it's uh, it's hard. It just reminds me of urban renewal when I was a child, you know, and our communities were totally wiped out from urban renewal and the psychological impact that had on uh, me, but also uh, my mother never recovered from losing her home, you know, so it's, it's, it's just, it's just horrible. It's saddening. It's just very saddening. Yeah, that and in North Carolina, well we had about 75,000 structures flooded in North Carolina, uh, and I, an infinitesimally small, you know, percentage of those have been bought out, right? FEMA buyouts are extremely rare uh, in North Carolina for these structures. And so, you know, a, a, especially a family, a homeowner, uh, you know, who is low wealth, but still owns land and a home that is, you know, by far their biggest asset. And so asking that person to to leave is is just an impossible ask. There's no there's no way to buy new land and a new home, uh, and there's you know just a complete loss of of any generational wealth that that was developed, you know, by owning that land by passing that land down uh, to 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 your children. I mean, it's just it's just an impossible ask. Nobody can do it. Nobody can leave uh, in, a, in a really poor area and go someplace else because every place else is more expensive, especially now that your property has been devalued by the fact that it flooded. Uh, so it, it's not like you can just trade out. These were great comments. Um, so um, we are going to go ahead and um, uh, wrap it up here. So once again, thank you for the comprehensive um, conversation and presentations from our storytellers. Um, at this point, we are actually going to um, take a break and I believe reconvene at um, 2.30. Um, so once again, um, thank you all for your time and sharing your um, 
uh, your stories with us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the session uh, one and two. And now we're gonna kick off uh, the third session with Laura. Laura, are you able to, yeah, I can see your camera. You can unmute yourself and please take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session three. Our focus in session three is to identify the barriers to implementation knowledge gaps or lapses of communication and effectively addressing flooding challenges. Um, we just heard incredibly powerful stories from across the country and thank you again to our storytellers. I think that sets us up with um, a number of challenges. Um, and you know our, our goal here uh, is to recognize that there aren't singular solutions, particularly across scales or geographies. And so in our breakout rooms, we'll acknowledge that space between the barriers and gaps that have been identified and um, potential integrated solutions. Um, and uh, we want to, in this session, not only outline issues, and but also look forward uh, toward creating a vision for what will work best in the future. Some logistics. All attendees will be assigned to breakout rooms. We're using a World Cafe format. So diverse perspectives are considered uh, in each of these pre-selected themes. This means that you'll have the opportunity to visit three different rooms and provide your input on different themes during the activity. You'll spend 25 minutes in the first room and then 20 minutes in the subsequent two rooms. When you enter the room, uh, if you find they've been uh, assigned to the same room twice, then exit out. Uh, uh, leave to leave the breakout room and you'll be reassigned to a different room. And some of you have already been notified and selected as active participants in the breakout rooms in the first round. Um, but we invite everyone to participate in the breakout room discussions, whether that's by speaking, writing in the, in the chat, or writing your ideas on the Jamboard. All participants will be enabled to use their mic and video if they choose. Uh, and the room themes will be posted in the chat and are um, as follows. Uh, green, blue, and gray infrastructure is group one. This could include stormwater infrastructure, remote sensing, and hydrological cycle, cost and challenges for the municipality to take on the work. The second is economic recovery, resilience, and stability. This could include economy uh, at different scales, small, rural, larger cities, uh, economic impacts for residents and the prosperity of the locality. Health and healthcare. This could include the health risks and health impacts of flooding, food security, access to healthcare facilities and emergency responses. And fourth, social cohesion and housing. This could include lower income housing prone to flooding, multi-generational housing, insurance coverage, relocation, and rebuilding of affordable housing. Uh, all breakout attendees will have access to the chat and can participate by populating the Jamboard. Just mentioned that. Uh, it will be important to note that only room three, uh, health and healthcare, will be recorded and posted to the website. 
uh, this group will stay in the main room with me, um, and the other rooms will be recorded uh, for um, uh, reporting purposes only. And with that, I think we'll all be uh, assigned to our breakout rooms. So hold tight. Okay, so um, uh, if you are remaining, you are likely uh, supposed to be here in the health uh, and healthcare breakout room. Um, I invite you to turn on your camera if you would like to. Great, great, nice to see some faces, welcome. Um, so now I'm gonna, uh, I hope that there's a, a staff person joining us and uh, can help us with the Jamboard, which is one of the main ways that uh, we're going to work through some questions together. Is that? Hi. <laughs> I, oh, post I posted the, uh, the link on the chat. So if great. you like to open it. If you have any issue uh, accessing it, we can also um, share our screen, but we also want to have this room with camera on to being able to have a conversation. So let us know if you have any issues. So Great. this, go ahead, go ahead, Laura. Do you want to? Uh, uh, I think it'd be, maybe good to go th uh, walk through the Jamboard for a minute um, and maybe share the screen and, and walk through it. Of course, let's do that. Um, let me share my screen right now. Yes, Excuse Jackie. me. Yes, yeah. go ahead. May I, ask, may I ask how I get to another room? Um, you, so why would you want to go in the other room? Maybe I'm gonna ask that question. Uh, I like this room. <laughs> I, I like the topic of housing and social cohesion because that's related to the work that I do. So we are going to do a word cafe, meaning that you're going to stay in this room for 20 minutes, then you're going to go to another room and then another room. So okay, I'm saying fine. That because we're going to okay. have all perspective mixed in and uh, you'll get to probably go to the if at the third one you're not in the one you want then you can ask that person hey i would really want to go in that one but we really want the mix of perspective and experiences here uh all of you have something to to share okay so let me am i i'm not, I'm not sharing am i sharing the right screen yeah good okay so there is a few slides here. We have our, our little space on the breakout room three. This is health and healthcare. However, like I said, you're just here for, for 20 minutes and then after you're gonna be moved to another room. Um, so today and during the day, you've heard about those uh, different stories. We're gonna be identifying the barriers in implementation. So this is really your space to continue on that conversation, what you've heard what really resonated with, with, with you when you heard some stories or what personal experience that you have. Um, this is going to be uh, in the second slide here that you can, if you, if you have the ability to get to the Jamboard, you have sticky notes, you can take the color that you fancy and then you can uh, write here uh, your barriers that you have identified as being important in the conversation that we have today. Um, that's great. And then we will arrange yeah. this. Team. So, um, oops, I don't know who is moving uh, the information. Do not play with this. Um, 
we're going to go through this. There is an opportunity for you to either put that in the chat. If you do not want to uh, play with sticky notes, you can put in a chat and then us as uh, as staff, we can put it in on a sticky note. You can also talk. Um, this is really made to be accessible for all type of, of, uh, of participants. The one who like to write, the like the word to talk, uh, or the one who really don't want to go on Jamboard. Um, and uh, and that's it. And then you'll be Great. moved out. Okay, take it Thank away. Thank you. So my suggestion is that we all take a couple minutes uh, and uh, work on this slide of barriers. Uh, so um, we can all write a couple uh, of the posted notes um, for what is the biggest challenge you have identified and faced related to flooding uh, and tell us about a problem that you don't have the power to change related to flooding. So add your add your thoughts with a few a sticky notes, and then um, and then we'll have a conversation about what we see, and then move on to the the second slide. Sound okay, everyone? Give it give, if you haven't used Jamboard, uh, uh, give it a shot, and let me know if you have any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now. I'll give you the, the, the time. Think also about those barriers in the context of solutions. That last slide, that slide number four, is also for solutions. We don't want to lose any of those. So while you're thinking about the barriers, you can also have the, the holding spot for solutions. Is this working for folks? Are you able to add? I see Sharanda says here, a big challenge that I've faced is that there's an aquifer under my house and everyone on my block experiences fresh water flowing into our basements during heavy rain. Thank you. So that sounds like it's, um, also the maybe an infrastructure challenge to address that. Um, maybe also a governance one of getting the attention in your community toward that issue. I just posted the second part of it, which was similar to that as you were saying it. Yeah. Um, oh, please I was, me. Yeah, I was just saying that maybe they should tap into it as like a fresh water source, a fresh water well, because uh, it comes right out of like a hole in my basement wall. It is the cleanest, crispest, purest water. I'm like, I should taste it, but I'm like, oh, it might be contaminated, but it's amazing. Um, but I will say to add for myself, uh, my mother, this, uh, my mother owns my house that I live in and she lives somewhere else, but uh, she was at the um, Home Depot or something, I think it was. And, you know, I used to use the sump pump and have to dump it out. And the gentleman said, you know, what are you doing here? You know, they, they were talking and he suggested that she use a swimming pool pump to suck the water out. So we, you know, when it gets flooded like that, you know, the water gets sucked out really quick uh, and it just goes right into the sink. But then after a while, I guess some of the chips off the paint from the floor, of course, the paint chips up, I guess it got clogged up so it doesn't work very well now. But that was the remedy that we did have. Um, homegrown solutions. It, I think that also gets to um, some of the comments in the un, in the stories of like, it's communities helping each other. Uh, residents helping each other. I should have said to reminder that our our focus here is health and healthcare. So again, that that covers a broad range, but especially be thinking about emergency services, um, uh, some of the the access after flooding events um, to uh, medication, um, uh, to power supply, to uh, clean water um, contamination. Um, so uh, you know, especially on on these issues. So let me just add the water, uh, like last month sometime, I don't know who else lives in New Jersey, but it rained so bad that everybody's roof was like leaking. My, I had water dripping in my bedroom for the first time ever, it was crazy. And so my mother had to put on a new roof. But uh, one thing that we can connect this to with health is that with this water and the flooding, it creates mold conditions and it affects health. 
and people don't realize the neurological problems and health issues that people can, you know, develop because of leaky water, water damage and mold in your home or in your school. Thank you. Um, let's see, I see one here, um, representation mis mismatch of healthcare workforce and decision makers um, uh, and the communities being served, bias and empathy. Uh, is there anyone who wants to speak to that? Did the person who, who wrote that down like to explain that a little more? Yeah, I wrote that one. Um, and that just comes from, I think, the mismatch. Um, one, just kind of positionality. I'm a civil engineer. Um, so already being a Black woman in civil engineering, it's it's been, there's not many of us. Um, so then outside of that, communicating that type of knowledge that you bring that is slightly different in the way you view things. So like representation just generally in the spaces you occupy, but then also in the in the communities that we're trying to reach and, and target, if we think about like Justice 40, um, trying to target certain communities, but then realizing we don't have the workforce that represents those communities and thus tend to still not know how to work within those capacities yet um, or how to manage those resources. Um, but then also, again, this is speaking from being um, a Black woman, so like very much my perspective, but going to a hospital, looking for Black doctors, um, people who perceive what you feel, whether it's how they perceive your pain levels and those type of things. So there's just, in terms of this, which, which is health, um, I was thinking more of the lines of that, of what it's like for uh, Black individuals, residents, community members to go into healthcare facilities and the trust that's built there and what could be fixed truly through representation and workforce development within the communities that are um, kind of dealing with some of these issues. So that's what I kind of meant, all encapsulated in that one little comment. Um, you brought up a lot. So um, the workforce piece, super important, building that out and also having that reflect uh, the communities that they're serving, but also the like the idea of trusted spaces, right? So like in disaster, knowing that you can go to a hospital or go to a, a shelter and know that you will be treated respectfully and 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 appropriately. And so and having that that's one of those kind of um, you know, we talk a lot in natural disasters about um the hard infrastructure, but that kind of like human capital and social infrastructure is really important. So to the person who's, who said that um, that their work was especially on the the um, social capital side and, and the or social cohesion side, I think there's a real overlap here on health and healthcare. Um, uh, I welcome anyone else to 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 add on to that comment um, or to raise one uh, another challenge that that you um, identified on the Jamboard. Someone else who hasn't spoken? Sorry, I joined a bit late. Uh, but one of the real challenges that I'm having in Toledo, Ohio, is we have um, a fund uh, uh, to help residents when their basements are flooded. But they, they don't access it because what they need to have up front, their front cost before they can access what the city can can provide is very little or none. And what we provide does not, we provide about 2000 and we know that any cleanup will be way more than that. So the challenge I'm having is how do I, one, the, lower the lower the amount that the, the residents are required to, to have up front so that the, they can at least access the, the resources that the, the city has and also increase um, the amount that the city ha is making available and be able to you know take that to city council and the city council agreeing to put more funding towards that. So that's so I don't know whether any other community has been faced with that situation, but it's really a, I mean we every year we budget about 200, 200, for this program, and we only get we are only able to give out sixty two thousand, and 
the equity part of this is the people who end up qualifying for the grant or for the support are people who were able to have the up the the money at the first you know at the front end so that they can show that they were they needed to be compensated so while the framing of the pro the problem was equity the implementation of it of the project of the funding takes away equity um I think the funding piece is huge. And I think, and I would love us to try to figure, like incorporate that into our solutions, right? I mean, that's like, and and to be thinking if we can with um, with funding solutions, thinking how can we multi-solve potentially? Like, are there ways that we can use funding to do multiple things at once given those, you know, as you're saying, really limited municipal budgets. Um, and I think that like the solution of looking for, Funding at the from our state or from our federal, we saw the the figures showing that you know the costs are going up everywhere, and so there's um, scarce resources. Right. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, Michaela has a, a comment here. I work on the sustainability department of a hospital, and we have limited grant funding for building climate resilience. Because of this, we are focusing only on our most pressing climate risk: wildfires and wildfire smoke. Um, yeah, so that's uh, Michaela. To some extent, that's that's this fund the the limited resources piece um, and um, uh, and the ch you know the challenge of um, not having enough to cover all of all of the climate risks. So um, let's move to um, let me look at this. Um, Let's move to the second, so it's slide three, and we're just gonna start, we won't make it through this, but know that your colleagues who join in the next session, as, as we move around, we'll be able to add to it. So um, the next slide, uh, what barriers exist in providing emergency medical services to marginalized populations during and after floods? And what knowledge gaps exist about the health impacts of flooding? Um, and I welcome you to add, um, add a couple um, post-it notes here. You can also maybe put like a star or some kind of mark on um, on one if you like uh, one that was written by somebody else. I just want to add that um, I saw, signed on to this because I wanted to make sure that Midwestern kind of non-hurricane areas were represented. And so the comments from previous uh, speakers, I think, really resonated with me as a, um, as a Southeast Michigan resident and someone who works with community partners in Detroit. Um, a, a lot of these issues relate to the, the home, the quality of the home that may be poor as a result of like historical discriminatory lending and redlining issues. So it's really tied to other issues like energy efficiency, which we're also working on right now at University of Michigan. Thank you. Um, yeah, I um, fully agree. And, you know, on the, the health and healthcare side, that leads to um, the some of the the post storm impacts, the post flood impacts on on mold um, and you know exposure to other uh, exposure to pathogens that that were discussed in the other in the other presentations. I think it's also you know you can imagine and or maybe you can tell us, Karina, um, uh, it, then that may be tied to access to emergency services or the quality of um, or the the um, proximity of hospitals. Um, uh, to address the health effects of flooding. Um, often that's co-occurring with um, poor communities and, and uh, lower quality housing. Yeah, it's a, definitely a huge concern. Um, there was an NIH climate and health scholar last summer who was very focused on issues around access to hospitals during emergencies, including but not limited to flooding. And it's not just hospitals, it's also 
pharmacies to renew your prescriptions and um, you know clinics in, in the community. So you you can be cut off from all of those. And, and we've seen that in several hundred year floods in the past decade in Detroit where um, you just could not get off your block. Uh, access to dialysis. Um, hi. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, please. Yeah, I was gonna say hi, I put something in the chat previously about um, populations with disabilities. Um, Thank you. And elder please. populations as well. Um, some of the challenges and I think not enough attention to those populations in terms of, you know, how do you get to them? How do they access medical care? How do they evacuate, et cetera? Thank you. And that was really raised in the um, the story in Puerto Rico. Um, really um, important considerations there. One of the things from the presentation that I hadn't thought of, I think that connects to that, was someone was talking about how the community has a list, um, is able to, like the social cohesion factor of almost having an inventory of knowing who in your community would fall into those categories and, and being able to have a process that, whether it's health agencies or just having access to that list of where those people are so you can prioritize them. And I thought that was a really um, great, I mean, obviously a great idea, but interesting about how it also depended on the social cohesion factor of how close the community is in order to feel comfortable to be sharing that information um, with each other. I work in uh, New York City at the health department and we have a program called Be a Buddy um, where we uh, fund community organizations to kind of do that, the, do the wellness checks and sometimes they're already doing them, but but adding the climate lens to them. Um, but uh, but it's not, it's, it's some of this happens naturally, but other other pieces of this require funding and, and the logistical support uh, to organize it. Uh, Carol. Thank you. I, I'd like to build off of, uh, I think it was Sydney that was talking about registries for, indivi um, for individuals that would have needs. I uh, lit, work for the state of New Hampshire Department of Health, and for the longest time I've been at there for 19 years, I've often thought about, you know, having a registry. And um, because we have a nuclear power plant on our coast, uh, there's a requirement um, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to have at least within the emergency planning zone EPZ, those 22 odd towns, you know, would would have to establish something. But there's uh, certainly a lot of uh, discussion and some science base um, in the literature that that says, you know, having a registry is is very difficult to maintain. Um, people move people die, and unless you have a process that ensures um, somebody's committed to updating that registry, you know, that's part of the challenge. The other part is people put their name to a registry and they think, oh, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to plan. Somebody's going to come and get me because my name's on a registry. And, you know, I, I've given that a lot of thought too. And I guess it really depends on the culture and the, the, um, establishment of that community. Um, if it's a small community, chances are people already know who's who and the emergency management director, emergency management agency, police department, fire department might know that individual, EMS might know that individual because they frequently have to, you know, come come to their their aid. But they, there's also an initiative underway nationally to invest uh, with the um, centers for independent living. Um, and Carol, I, I love this comment. Um, and sorry. We to, and it's, so I, I, I would add, I would advocate to work with your local silk. <laughs> Thank also you. To the other one. So please continue it um, with the other discussion. So we're going to, thanks everybody. Uh, and you are now going to move in your world cafe onto um, the other tables. Thanks again. And hopefully that will happen. Oh, we'll move. Yeah, there may be a couple minutes of silence as we get that coordinated on our end, but do not worry, we are on it. Okay, Carol. Uh, uh, any um, last last bits on your important comment? Yeah, 
I would just say work with your independent living councils. Uh, those are the ones that uh, work with individuals with disabilities, others with access and functional needs, and your home-based community. Um, so if you need more information, uh, the federal level has a, a whole discussion on the importance of, of utilizing them uh, in this plan. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Laura, how do we access this um, board? Oh, yeah. So there's a link in the chat, but let me... Um... I have the board from the previous one, but not this one. I'm oh. putting it in the chat right now, Laura. Perfect. So, um, so it sounds like we have some new folks, and maybe uh, um, my first group is in the process of moving. Sabina, is that right to have a mix? Yeah, so we are, I think everyone, or at least most of us are all in this room right now and we are getting we are getting organized and reshuffling everybody. We're trying to do our best to have to minimize repetition. So it's gonna take us a couple minutes as we uh, put everyone into the rooms. Laura, since this uh, room is recorded for the future recording on the on the website, if there is some folks that would want to chime in right now, um, you know, feel free to continue the conversation since we, we don't really have to interrupt the conversation in this room, actually. Okay, great. Yeah. And, and Jolly, please. Thanks. I was just, you know, this comment was raised, I think, during the storytelling, but in terms of uh, barriers, I think sometimes it's as simple as communication platforms. So between so proactive communication, which is sort of a theme that we've touched on for much of today already, but I think it's often overlooked. Um, and it varies really from community to community with trust and, you know, what kind of platforms can be most effective. Can you give a couple examples of uh, potentially useful platforms? Well, I think um, one thing that I've uh, used in my work with communities that has been that has seemed to be effective and at least a conversation starter is mapping participatory mapping and identification of resources and, you know, there you can use multiple layers and, but I think as an official communication platform. I think it depends whether it's public facing or internal, right? Um, and I would love to hear other people's examples because we're we're working on this problem in several communities. So I would I would open this up um, to people to see to to learn more about communication platforms that have been uh, successful um, in communities. Great and. Uh does anyone else have one that they can offer? Raise your hand or add it to the chat. I will say part of the Apple Shop story, um, uh, I lived for a short time in that, that town in Whitesburg, Kentucky. They have a, a community radio station, um, but it went down in the floods. And so I think I'm getting the story right. And Mimi, if you're on, please please uh, tell it for me. Uh, um, <laughs> uh purchased i think an rv to stand up like the, the the radio station went down in the flood um and so purchased an rv to um to to bring that back online quickly knowing that that was in rural communities um that that communication piece was really important yeah we did do that but it did take a while to do it to get it back up but also and somebody mentioned earlier well people have cell phones they can just you know connect by cell phones but we lost cell phone service. And uh, one of the things was a lot of people, there were some emergency, <clears throat> you know, texts that went out, but since people had lost cell phone service, they didn't get those. And uh, then they didn't have cell phone service for a good while after the flood. So, right. you know, emergency folks couldn't get to them, didn't know, you know, even what, what had happened. Mm-hmm. I suppose there would need to be multiple sort of parallel processes, right? 
And and before we were we were talking uh, earlier in the morning about some of the speakers were talking about sort of these communities of practice and between academia and communities really building trust over time and having proactive conversations and participating in the community before disasters in order to build trust. But I would even say to take some of those lessons within communities between government and residents and you know various sectors even within communities to be having those conversations proactively in order to build trust and alert people to different ways of communicating and accessing information in both directions and you know all directions really between uh, government and residents um, and residents and right and in, in in different directions, um, but to build that trust over time before disasters um, is essential. Really well said. Thank you. Sabina, should we continue in our general discussion or? Um... Yeah, continue in your discussion. We're trying to figure out how to best go about this. Okay. Um, I'm interested in the um, kind of going off of that. And we were talking about resilience hubs this morning, um, this idea of, of trusted spaces and, and more generally about what can we do in kind of blue sky days to prepare ourselves for flooding and the health impacts of, for flooding. Um, in addition to the infrastructure that we need to do, what else do we need to do on, on a governance, governance side or on a, on the, the, um, uh, trusted relationships, setting up communication systems. Um, I welcome any suggestions for uh, what we can be doing to be uh, building the foundation well. I'll tell this, I, so I, I mentioned this in our breakout session, but I'll, I'll tell the story again. I work at the New York City Health Department. Um, we have a, a program called Be a Buddy that uh, uh, works with, uh, now it's it's planning to work with older adult centers, senior centers, um, before it worked with community organizations, which provided contracts and training and funding um, to uh, create um, buddy systems. So um, kind of wellness checks uh, with uh, vulnerable, generally older adults. And, and it was, you know, we were doing the checks uh, in on the good days to build to build the relationship. Um, but then uh, when there was, it was mostly for heat waves, but you could imagine it generally for flooding as well, um, that then it would activate, the system would activate um, during during an, an emergency and uh, and check on uh, check on their buddies provide information. And actually it was created before COVID. And then uh, when COVID happened, it really activated and expanded to be able to provide, are you getting the food that you need? Can we, can I drop off something for you? Are you, do you know about, um, do you have masks? Do you, do you have, you know, the different resources that you need? So it was this, um, it was, we were, I think, lucky to have created a system that then could activate in an unforeseen event. So I'm, I'm curious if there are other ideas like that out there of systems to set in place now. I'm wondering, Laura, if um, how how much that's been replicated? Do you know of other cities and how many um, have replicated that program? We hear of a lot of interest in it. I don't know. Um, uh, oh, I see someone saying, oh will, oh, will the buddy program be coming to Buffalo? I, we hear of a lot of interest in it. Um, uh, and you know, our experience is that it took funding, that our, our program had funding associated, and that's sometimes a challenge. Um, but you can also imagine creating, it's also just changed our messaging. We try to say when we're giving advice about there's a heat, you know, the heat season coming up or the flooding, you know, flooding is expected to remind people to check on, to check on their neighbors and give them the key pieces of information to, to check their neighbors, check on their neighbors about. Uh, this is the net Greer. I, I, I'm driving, so I cannot cut my video on. But I wanted to say I think we need uh, perspective planning, like the lady who talked about the devastation in Puerto Rico, where electrical infrastructure is down, 
where your cell towers are down, where your water is down, your transportation is down. Um, we need to have proactive means of survival for those times. So how do we um, prepare water that is ingestible during those times that we know is not ingestible? Do we have tablets? Do we have a process? Um, do we have stockpiles of medical supplies? She talked about um, insulin being not available to individuals who needed it. So our nation and our officials should have policies. Um, I mean, even COVID caused such a problem where there are stockpiles of response items that can be readily available instead of waiting for inefficient shipping of clean water, have a means of um, cleaning the water locally so it can be immediately consumed, have a kinds of food uh, that can be easily prepared so that we don't have starving children, have, um, I, I, I just think we need a more proactive plan. Thank you, Annette. Uh, I open that to, to the group for discussion. Does anyone have a, um, a, a story, um, an experience that, that shows um, a possible solution in that area? Annette? Uh, oh, um, yeah. Annette, that's that's exactly how we started with our organization, Coalition of Nurses for Communities in Disaster. Um, we started teaching the community how to prepare water, how to care for for the other in 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 different in different um, events uh, of disaster, um, and and that that exactly was how we started. I mean, a group of volunteers who. Um, just we got together and decided to teach the communities how to how to do that, how to how to prepare water and 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 we have a program and there's a, a national program, um, the CERT program. I don't know if you know about it, the uh, community emergency response teams, and they have a good program that they have modules and they teach the communities on how to respond to uh, to different types of. of disasters and probably that's a good start because it creates teams and and it creates um uh, it creates uh colleagues and and and, and all sorts of, of help from one another thanks so abigail i have a message from the organizers uh which is that we are ready to open the breakout rooms uh you will be given the option of which one so you can select uh one that you haven't been part of already uh, and the, the staff and committee members will be assigned. So uh, I hope you, you see that pop up on your screen and you can select a new, uh, new breakout room to participate in. It's already been written. Um, look at what has already been written, and uh, and you can add um, uh, add a note. Uh, you can also maybe put a star or, or a mark on one that you that you really agree with. Uh, so we'll do that for a minute, and then um, and then we'll discuss what we see here. 
Is everybody doing okay getting to the Jamboard? Oh, great. I see a check mark. I like it. Okay. So we're seeing some um, kind of physical barriers uh, like road closures that um, might stop ambulances from getting through or people from evacuating or getting to medical services, um, uh, access to elect electricity for charging phones that would also be for charging medical equipment. Um, but then there's also some um, kind of um uh social infrastructure or um capacity kinds of issues um governance issues everything from lack of health insurance lack of trust in the healthcare system by marginalized populations we talked about that um uh, a bit in the last session what else is getting lots of ch of checks here those with mobility challenges um, like wheelchairs, visions are reluctant to evacuate because of safety concerns of where they end up um, or, or the full inability to evacuate. Lack of knowledge of community needs and who is most impacted during the event. Great. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of barriers. So now I think we're, we're starting to make the shift. We have lots of barriers down, starting to make a shift toward um, visions of solutions. So thinking about what, what are ones that we can, you know, what, what are some of these challenges that, that we can shift toward, toward solutions? Um, and uh, I invite, you know, when you're looking at this barriers list, does anyone have um, a best practice that they know about, or um, are they thinking about something that they, that they think is an important piece of a solution to addressing either um, uh, some of the the infrastructure challenges or um, some of these other systemic challenges. Any volunteers? We can also talk, uh, continue to talk about challenges. So um, I think someone added a new one here um, and I, I didn't, I saw something being added, but I didn't actually notice which one it was. It, um, did anyone add a, um, a post-it and want to, to raise it? Hi, this is Morgan Levison. I did um, add a post-it around the lack of knowledge of community needs. Um, okay. And so th that was one of the, the pieces that, um, so I'm from a health unit, which is just north of Toronto in Canada. So um, slightly different situation in terms of some of the, the healthcare systems and um, processes that are in place up here than down south. But, um, you know, in terms of, when our communities have some of these you no know, flood risks or anything climate related in terms of climate emergencies, some of the challenge are is just a, a lack of knowledge of what the community needs are at the time. Um, so, you know, without having done planning before an event, um, it can be difficult to, to know who within the community needs your help, um, especially when you're thinking about, you know, higher um, risk individuals, such as those that are socially isolated, they, you know, sort of fall through the cracks. And so um, it, if you don't have those, those pieces there, that can be difficult. Thank you. Um, yeah, we were also talking in the last session about um, the, the need to identify people, but also to explain what that what that means. Someone was explaining, you know, there are often registries that people can add themselves to, but recognizing that um, those registries then need to be used and, and the people on the registries need to know um, uh, still what, what to do in an emergency. And so um, it's, it's kind of understanding that landscape as you're talking about Morgan, and then also creating the, um, the right um, kind of 
preparedness system to to apply the planning. Um. Yeah, Annie. Hi, thanks. Um, so sort of building off um, Morgan's comment, um, so I'm at the California Department of Public Health and sort of trying to think about how to um, conduct surveillance around health impacts um, related to um, climate. And so I was curious if anyone, you know, is already conducting surveillance for flooding related health impacts and whether there are any best practices around gathering information about who has been impacted and what the community needs are, especially if they're not able to get to a hospital. You know, we traditionally use things like emergency department visits, but that might not be, you know, a great data source. Thanks. Thanks, Annie. Any responses to that? Anyone else doing tracking? I'll say at the New York City Health Department, um, so one thing we did was that we had um, terrible flooding in Hurricane Ida, um, and uh, and the biggest issue was basement flooding, um, uh, and 13 people died, um, uh, primarily in basements, or maybe all of those were in basements. And so um, our research team did um, a study of the, of the um, uh, a mortality study um, and looked at the circumstances of death. And that's been important. You know, that was a, a small number, um, uh, but it was important for then we're looking at um, basement, regulating basement apartments. And that, so it, it helps us to understand the conditions, both of the, the apartments, um, but also of the, the lack of, of, of um, communication prior to the event and reaching the people that, that were most at risk. And so it's informing also our, our communication strategies. Um, so so that, that's one small piece. We've been talking about doing similar surveillance for flooding as we do for heat, um, but, but you raise a good point that they're not always um, uh, reaching, um, reaching the hospital system. Morgan says, um, we're in the same process of trying to identify surveillance practices and indicators. So it, this is that, that goes in our knowledge in the knowledge gaps here. Um, I'll read Maisie's. Maisie said, uh, I added translation and interpretation of information, really important. During disasters, resources are always stressed and finding quality translation and interpretation of information can be difficult, especially if translation and interpretation of resources are already lacking in an area. So um, so maybe you're suggesting trying to pre-plan for that, create those materials um, beforehand. Um, so how about if we shift um, to the, it's actually the, the slide that's up on, on the shared screen um, on the potential solutions. So we've got um, a couple that are already marked and I invite you to mark others too. Um, stronger linkages between healthcare system and home repair services. That's interesting. Does anyone want to speak to that solution? It sounds uh, uh, it sounds to me like home repair services like um, um, repairing homes after flooding, maybe providing um, funding or recommendations for flood for mold remediation. Um, I'd be interested to know if that has been done in places and, and how that worked and how the funding worked for that, how the referral services worked. Um, it's a really interesting idea. What else is on here? Um, include disaster topics in all educational levels, starting in kindergarten. Proactive communication locally tailored uh, by the community. Integration of climate change considerations into healthcare policies, practices, and infrastructure development. You know, I think 
one thing that I see in this um, is also the need for um, providing templates or models for uh, especially lower resourced, um, but, you know, generally municipalities or organizations to implement. Um, I think, you know, we want to do all these things and a lot of times we just um, don't have the, the person power uh, to do these amidst all the other um, stresses in a, in a municipality. And so, um, you know, I think as part of these solutions, how can we um, uh, ask our state governments or our federal government um, to provide some of these as models for us? Or how can we um, have um, foundations, you know, take some of this on as um, ways to provide something that that many of us could use? One, one thing about the, the question or the point about um, helping people connect with contractors, there is a lot of concern about people getting scammed, particularly older mm -hmm. folks. So, you know, a better business bureau or some kind of um, vetting process that, you know, that does say these people are legit um, <clears throat> who can help you rebuild or whatever would be helpful, I think. Did you have anything like that or um, after the flooding in Kentucky or, or did you just experience the um, the downside of not having it? <laughs> um, well, usually we have very few contractors, very few plumbers, carpenters, uh, whatever. But after the flood, you definitely saw, you know, their their trucks everywhere. So, you know, I don't know if they were itinerant or just coming in from the cities, but I know people, there was some concern and, and I did hear of a few cases where, you know, people got ripped off, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know of a, a resource. Um, there are yeah. two good nonprofit um, home repair and home builder organizations in the region. And they, they really stepped up um, and they've been great. So it's good to find, you know, find those, um, folks and, you know, help them to really raise funds and do more and, you know, maybe be part of that process. Yeah. Thank you. I, again, this sounds like something that I, uh, it's good to do in blue skies if we can, um, of be able to create those relationships, support, support local businesses, create lists like that. Um, so there was a note that that went through, um, please feel free to, to shift to another, um, breakout session if you'd like. Um, and we'll continue the discussion on solutions here. There's a common, seems to be a common concern. Mm -hmm. Empowering a broader force, I like that. Sure, it's tough. There's yeah, it's chicken and egg between funding availability and, and local priority setting. Yeah, that's great. Breaking down uh, the silos, centering equity as we do so. Yep. Emphasizing prevention is a really important one. Yeah, there's underlying land use and economic drivers that underlie a lot of the decisions that get made. Yeah, creating right incentives. Avoiding priorities established by academics. Appreciate that one. I'm planning for the long term. Mm hmm. Maybe institutionalizing this kind of collaboration and research. Making kind of building this into the way we do things. Yeah. Tapping into communities in ways that respect their time. Makes a lot of sense.
Great. This is a great, uh, this reads as a great um, collection and, and synthesis in some ways, at least of the, some of the conversations I was, I was part of. It's great to see these in one place. The need for policy change and development in all sectors as we face this challenge. Mm -hmm. I like this, right? It's sort of, we're not isolating this to a single, this isn't a single department or a single sector's responsibility. This integration challenge. Yeah, balancing community and, and technical expertise, navigating that, um, that line. Mm -hmm. Deeply analyzing bias to root out racism by design, really digging into, again, in a different way, but kind of digging into these underlying drivers uh, of the problems, underlying drivers of the inequities. Practice for disaster response relief. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. I like this emphasis on preparation ahead of time. This is great. We've got about one more minute uh, for collecting these if anyone has last thoughts they want to make sure get captured in this in this format of course we've got our sticky notes we've got our recordings um but there's any any last um central ones need for sustained support to vulnerable communities including transitioning in new locations without losing social capital kind of keeping keeping options on the table, including real-time experiences, real people, and the willingness to change. Additional communication resources, communi community leaders. Yeah, that's, um, like that one. Planning is great. We have to deal with real-time changes as well. Sure, it's hard to, hard to perfectly predict, especially at this point, what's, what's on the horizon. Staying flexible, representation, inclusion, allyship, storytelling, important data. Yeah, really centering these experiences. More research on individual and community resiliency. Yeah, sort of really understanding what it is that tips the scales maybe one way or the other. Okay, great. Resource compensation for best practice. Yeah. Yes, that's great. Really investing in, we're investing in what we value. Um, these are great. I'm going to turn it over now um, to Charles, who's going to take us into um, our last our last piece here. But these were fabulous. Thank you, everyone, for participating and um, and sharing these these great great ideas, great perspectives. Hey everyone, Charles Burgess with the National Academies here. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate all your input, your participation, your comments. We'll be recording these comments along with our saved meeting recording um, for our for our briefing. Next, we're gonna go back to Venkat Lakshmi, um, the, the co-chair of the planning committee to um, give us some concluding remarks. So Venkat, please take it away when you're ready. Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. And thank you so very, very much to all of the participants. I think at one point I saw 180 or 190 people on the uh, uh, on the on the Zoom call. So it's a it's a testament to how important this topic is and how interested people are in in to contribute, to learn and to move forward. So we covered a lot of ground today and the complex interactions between flooding, natural and built environment, the intersection with other social justice issues, policy. Uh, political will, 
funding, communication from ground up and back again. So I'll try to summarize a few things. I think the last particular session was so nice with actually not my own comments, but also comments from most of the people in the chat. And so a so couple of things, and I have a few items which I would like to read out and I'll share it with the with the uh, National Academy staff so that it will be a part of their record. So one of the most important things we I found out is that communication and connection with communities is very important. Uh, and we are trying to break down silos and bring together engineering, landscape planning, social science, social uh, advocacy, community groups, empowering people with a shared solution. Basically, the shared solution is more important than just empowering and you know, not being equal partners. The uh, second thing is flooding is a real risk. And FEMA maps are FEMA maps. I mean, they have to be updated. A hundred year flood today is not a hundred year flood next year, because if you have another hundred year flood today, the, the statistics change. So, you know, we have to understand and communicate with federal agencies for updating these maps. And this is the job of civil engineers in conjunction with community groups. Now, one of the things which we also touched about is, you know, interventions and multiple touch points. So, so this is not a simple problem with one particular group. But if you look at this, this is a big bunch of industries, uh, insurance industry, health, public health, clinics, zoning industry, and, uh, and of course, all the community groups. Now, surveillance is important. Interpretation is important. And all of the planning is great, but when you get to a disaster, reality is sometimes so much different. And you know, getting that disaster supply chain to uh, the, the dis disaster relief supply chain to the people who are most vulnerable in case of, of a flood is, is very important. And various scenarios have to be you know, planned in advance. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of the comments made in these uh, uh, discussions was reinvesting in communities, you know, trying to figure out what really matters. And some of these investments have to be equitable, which is uh, both the, uh, I, I call it the hard stuff and the soft stuff. The hard stuff is actually building stuff, but the soft stuff is in investing in developing excellence and workforce. And all of them cannot be done with the with a frame of five years or 10 years. We have to be looking at 20, 50, and 100 years, just like the people in climate science look at. So I would finally try to thank our speakers and the panelists for sharing their expertise. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members, but most importantly, and this is something which I have to say over and over again, because I'm so impressed with them, the National Academy staff. I mean, I want to thank Audrey, Charles, Sabina, Lala, and Crystal, you guys are amazing. You know, you guys are the thing which holds the glue, which holds these logic together. So thank you so very, very much. So thanking uh, them for making this happen today. And I want to thank you all in advance for going to come on Monday, the 18th and join for the second part of this workshop. And please continue to keep on uh, populating the Jamboard and the solution slide after this webinar and integrate them into the discussion of the second day of the workshop, which is as important. And it's a real, another uh, a star studded line of speakers for you. So thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. It's four o'clock. <laughs>